folks and welcome oh how you doing uncle bill buddy i've been run to death i've run to death now i'm just ready to do this show you just get back from work or something what the fuck you dressed up for this shit yeah i got my flannel on buddy i'm channeling the spirit of uh dawn of the dead my God. <laughs> rebel jones what up? bringing it back so uh this is a show that's been a i don't I, we first talked about this way back in early summer maybe or something like that and uh, it's been in development, the development stages for many months. But this is Forgotten Romero, the debut episode. We could have multiple episodes because they're still finding, you know, more Romero stuff almost every year, it seems like. so. Yeah, there's no real Forgotten Romero, though, in terms of like... Oh, yes, there is. We're ta- talking about one for sure on here. No, no, listen. Now, we're all familiar with that movie. I know what you're talking about. And you're going to be surprised. Well, well I have to say, because it's been 20 years since I saw it and just watched it again like a couple days ago. These dudes that we have on here is very familiar with it. So we're going to go ahead and do some introductions here. The man that claimed he had no idea that Earth Girls Are Easy was coming to blue <laughs> right? That piece of shit. He's currently working on Nightmare on Elm Street box set. Trick or treat from Best Strong. <laughs> That's coming out soon. What else are you working on? Be <laughs> <around> Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Slipcase hey. Felcher, folks. Uh, the doctor is Slipponomics, if you will. You know, Hi. you were you were Slippy before Slippy was cool. Really, now Slipcases are more important than the damn movies. It seems that way, doesn't it? It's a whole collector's market that's just come up and. You know, I go on eBay and see that it was like, I think the DVDs for sale. I said, no, 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 this is a slipcase only. It's like, who the hell's selling these things? It's an obsession with some people. Right. I don't quite share it, but, you know, whatever. Actually, it's I car- should sell off all the ones I have. I might be able to pay board. my rent one month. <laughs> it's an investment. Keep hanging on to those slipcases. So we appreciate yeah, you. That's, that's going to be my, my, you know, my estate. This year, four hundred one k is going to be the slip cases. slip cases. We'll be auctioning like on heritage <laughs> auctions here in five or six years. It'll be slip cases. <laughs> yeah, we'll be no, graded this, this, slip cases. We need to start. That needs to be our thing. We can oh grade God. slip yeah. cases. Uh, we have uh, decided that the slip case to the Mania Cop Three Blu Ray is not worth what you put down on your record, sir. It is not worth five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> but you know. It's got a nine people. point five rating on Beckett though. That yeah, whatever the hell that is. Is. I mean, there's there's auctions going on now for VHS that are sealed up in plastic boxes like baseball cards, and they're going for thousands of dollars. And I'm like, if I had known this shit back when the I worked in a video man, distributor, Goodwill's I'd have possibly I'd yeah. have all these things up in my closet, and I'd just be selling them off one by one and laughing my way to the bank. Yep. But uh, also joining us on here, we've got him backstage. Uncle Bill, he's backstage. One of the I, one of our oldest listeners, not not oldest as in age, but he's been like with Dead Pit following us since the very very beginning, 
And he is kind of a big deal now because he is part of the George Romero Foundation. You know him on the message board as Axlish, but he go. I think he pretty much just goes by Eric now. He was Axlish? I didn't on? know that. Hey, everybody. Oh, that oh. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're right, man. I, uh, I... I was on board since the Friday the 13th episode, Jesus. which was what your second episode, I want to say. But I, I was even following you guys on horror graphs. And I, you guys were, I think, posting about the show on maybe horror graphs or just other horror DVDs, perhaps. So I even I knew about it. I, I was kind of it took me a couple of weeks to catch on. But, yeah, I've been here since been following you guys since what? When was that? Oh, six, six, 2006, yeah. Yeah. 15. Mm-hmm. 15, 16 years ago or something like that, right? Or how long? Yeah. That can't be oh, yeah. that long. Wait. Well, no, it's, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. 16 years ago. <laughs> oh, my God. You, got, you guys I mean, have been doing this shit for 16 plus years? <laughs> well, what a waste of our lives. Oh, my God. Um, oh, mother. There's, there's a couple people that say, I'll listen to you guys when I was in like third grade. And I'm like, damn it. Third yeah. grade. <laughs> Yeah, and but, I, um, I actually I did a bunch of reviews for you guys. I'm I'm kind of the dead pit slippy. I actually uh, I did a few of your uh, DVD authoring projects. I, what was the uh, on the road? You did all of them? Oh, you all did all of, those things? Was it all yeah. of them? Okay, yeah, I think wow. it's all of them. Yeah, aside from like some of the commentary stuff, I think we uh, I can't remember. I think yeah, I did a couple of road. those too. Yeah, all all the on the roads as well, and. Yeah, I mean, it's the majority of them for sure. I'm still waiting on what se- season four. <laughs> well, here's what we got to do though. Season four <laughs> has got to be. We got to pull a Scream Factory here. It's got to be exclusive <laughs> box set on uh, Blu-ray. Yeah. We got. I thought you were gonna Blu-ray say it's got to explode or something with gases. All it's the gonna seasons, be greasy. And then... It's gonna be real greasy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm game when you're ready, and I think I, I think I think I can put it on Blu-ray now. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe we can do that. Yeah, DVD is so 2006. Definitely. Yeah. But I love I, DVDs. DVD. I, I think want that some uh, DVDs. Eric, man, I think that you were the one that sent me the map of all the places to go in Pittsburgh when I was up there. <laughs> it was like mm-hmm. a detailed, like instruction manual basically like a map of like all the different spots where romero filmed anything like that was that was pretty amazing you should see it now it's got dark half locations on there oh Oh, wow (laughs) no it's 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 expanded a lot since then i'll have to forward it to you if you ever if you're ever in the area anybody that's listening to this if you're going to pittsburgh i'll be happy to send you the map yeah it's very very helpful so we got a lot of people in the chat as well. We're going to get started here in a little bit talking about a couple of Romero films that not too many people talk about, really. I mean, there's one in particular that I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't even know exists. Look, um, man, <laughs> I, I, you're talking way too much shit about this movie already. Like, it's really not that bad. It's like Dracula 3D. It's not that bad. Oh, boy. Dracula 3D? Why are you bringing that up? Dracula 3D. Oh, it's a, <laughs> It's an inside joke, Sloopy. Trust me. Like, I really don't think Dracula 3D is that bad. And also, yeah, he does. I really don't. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were going to say. Well, you, <laughs> you, you really don't like should. it. No, he legit does. He's he's a fan. Yeah. No, I do. Kind he of was like happy it. with his purchase at Dollar Tree. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a praying but, mantis, like a giant, like Argento praying mantis. I'm fine with it. But this particular period here, what was it? A span of like what, 12 years or something like that, and he only did these two movies. Maybe even longer than that. I don't know. It would be well, 80, yeah, yeah, 87 to 2000. Yeah, yeah, and then you throw two evil eyes in there. True, uh, yeah. You know, briefly, right. but yeah, it was a weird... It was a, George and I had several conversations about this particular period, and it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, but, I, you know, I don't want to go on... You know, if you want to hear it, fine. Because I, I, he... The fact that George only made a couple of films during that period was certainly not his choice, and it was strange. Uh, he, he he really got caught up in the studio system. Basically, is what happened. You know, he wanted to move on and try bigger things. And his, you know, George had really big ideas. He always had really big ideas, and 
he always had to kind of kind of pull back a little bit when the you know the budgets finally came in on some of these things and he got caught up in development deals at universal mgm you know all over the place uh he had he was going to do something with ridley scott's company i mean there was just all this stuff and i remember him telling me once says michael i made more money during that seven or eight year period there than I ever did at any other point in my career collectively. You could add all up, and it didn't add up to what I made during that period. But nothing came of it. God. And that was like during his prime period. I mean, he lost, mm-hmm. you know, seven or eight years of his creative life in development crap. And having, he almost did The Mummy, the remake of The Mummy. He had a green light to do the remake of The Mummy. They were ready to hire him and bring him on, and they were Universal was going to go full speed. But because of a pissing match between them and MGM... And an existing deal he had to direct a movie out over at MGM. And MGM was pissed at Universal about something that had nothing to do with George whatsoever. They refused to release George from their contract to do this movie that they were never going to do. And George knew that. And it cost them the mummy. And in the end, they let that other deal expire. And MGM just did it pretty much out of spite. Used George as a, as a pawn mm-hmm. in this little spike game between them and Universal. So he didn't get to do that. You know, and, then, and there's... It's really kind of sad because, you know, he and I think that soured him on ever, you know, George was an independent filmmaker, but he loved Hollywood movies. He loved, he grew up on them. He, there was a part of him that very much wanted to try to function in that system. But after that, he realized that's just, no, that's not going to happen. That's just not who he was. And that's what ultimately led and I think feeds a lot of the anger that you see in Bruiser when you watch Bruiser. And so that's, you know, but he... It, it's a it's a frustrating period, and I was also coming off the heels of Monkey Shines and Dark Half, which were not easy experiences either. And those were both studio films, to a degree, but they were also kind of ha- ha- kind of stepping stones into that world. And he got he lost jobs because of those two movies too. You know, it was just it was just a weird time. It's a weird time for him. I think this is a weird time for horror in general, and we'll talk about that too. You know the the early nineties throughout, you know, scream happened and then mainstream horror was kind of those type of movies were popular, but you know, it was a while really. I mean, unfortunately for Romero and I want to get to the chat here in just a second, cause we've got all kinds of people posting stuff. Um, it was the zombie movies that really got his career started again, you know, mm-hmm. after that, after bruiser and, he never, I don't think he ever got the chance to make anything after Bruiser that was like not, you know, a dead movie. He came close a few times. He, that's the problem with George's career. He, had, he came close a lot of times. There was yeah, going to be this uh, espionage kind of historical drama that was going to take place down in Cuba that Ed Harris was going to be involved with, Al Pacino. That came really close, and then that fell apart for some reason. I mean, there was a whole bunch of things that, what about but that George, Be- Before I Wake with Sharon Stone? Can you elaborate? Do you know any details well, on I that? Before I Wake, I think that was that was one of those studio projects. MGM might have been involved. Cause I know he was also attached to another one called The Black Mariah. Which, uh, but uh, Before I Wake, I believe, was the pro- the MGM project that uh, got used in that you know pissing yeah. match between them and Universal. And then also Resident Evil. He was attached at one point to doing Resident Evil mm-hmm. before the company just decided we were going to go a different direction. Um, but it's weird, you know, George, at one point, I remember what, him saying, what a direction they went to. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> they you had know, a lot of money though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, again, I think that would have, I, I think George also looked at resident evil as a chance to get something on a big scale in a, in a, in a genre he was familiar with that had a good chance of getting, cause he also recognized, you know, if you do a film that gets out there, that, that's sort of a, a, a mass audience movie, it can benefit you in the long run. I mean, look at what happened with Wes a couple of times. You know, he had, you know, the Nightmare on Elm Street success that blew up and then Scream. And that allowed him to do music of the heart, you know. But I think with George, I remember saying towards the end of, you know, his career, especially around the time of Survival of the Dead, he says, like, Mike, I can't pass up a green light at this point in my career. It's hard enough to get a movie made anyway. So if they want to throw a few million dollars at me to do a zombie movie, I'm going to try and do my best to make that work and then tell the stories I want to tell through that. You know, using that in you know to explore classism and racism, and you know ignoring the problem, and you know that sort of thing, and 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 he did, and that's why I think those films work to the degree that they do because there's actually something going on there. 
but he also, you know, at the same time, he was probably, they're not going to give me, you know, $10 million to go make a tree grows in Brooklyn. You know, they're not going to, they're just not well, going to do that. Now that you mention it, though, I never thought about it, but Romero really never had his, like, poltergeist, did he? Like, the closest, his, like, the closest big... was Creep Show. The closest one yeah. was Creep Show. And that, oddly enough, Warner Brothers pulled their support from that movie right when it was, I mean, it opened, it did, it did huge numbers at first. And then the second week, they just killed all the advertising for it. It was almost like they went, all right, that one week, that's good enough, bye. And then they just, and they, and it was doing really well. And they, they cut the, the knees off of the thing. And it was, it could have done weeks more because back then you would stay in theaters for a little while, you know, it didn't have to just be in and out. And it, um, so that was the closest he ever had to like a big mainstream success. Although yeah. Dawn of the Dead was a big success, but that was more that wasn't like a cross <laughs> board, like a big op- opening weekend type of thing. I'm know? just thinking at it more in terms of like you know you got like Carpenter did like and this movie's not good, but I mean he did Memoirs of an Invisible Man with no, Chevy George... Chase and yeah, like yeah, yeah. and then you had Hooper did Poltergeist and then you had Craven did you know all the music of the heart and. You know, so so he never yeah. really had that kind of like flirting with those big. Well, he a- tried. I mean, he tried. That would have yeah. happened that was during that the period. 90s. Yeah. 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 That's when yeah. that would have happened. Was there a. a yeah. Slippy might know this. Was there a dream project for Romero that he never got to make? Like a. I'm sure it wasn't a zombie movie because he had every chance in the world to make, you know. He had. I mean, it could be a romance like, movie, a comedy, whatever it was, you know. George was sort of like the Louis L'Amour of screenwriters in that he wrote so much and came up with so many different treatments and screenplays and ideas for short stories and novels that will never plumb the depths of all the stuff he wrote. He, he, was, he wrote all the time. And I once asked him about the Dream Project thing. He said, why not really? It says it depends on when you talk to me. And I've had a lot of projects I really wanted to do. But I don't think there was ever one project that he was ever like, this is his white whale that he must conquer. Because George was the type of guy who was like, okay, that didn't work out. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, but he did want to do, one thing he did want to do, and he tried to get going for quite a few years, was an update and a remake of Season of the Witch. He said that was the only one of my properties I ever wanted to do an update on because I didn't think we got it right back then because we didn't have the money. And he said, I think that story is still very relevant today. And we could do a really interesting. He tried to get it going. A couple times. Well, they did one just... with uh, a few years ago with Nicolas Cage, but I don't know. If that, was... <laughs> that wasn't the, no. That yeah. was a, that wasn't exactly. That was a the, different sort of. It was deal. very loose remake. Very a very loose, remake. but no. He, he um, to my knowledge, he never had unless he just didn't you know didn't share that with me like that one that got away. I think there were a lot that got away overall. Yeah. And he mentioned wanting to do a western a lot, which I think he kind of. He kind of did sur- yeah. survival, you yeah, know, that yeah. kind of scratched that itch. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like you, like Wes was saying, you have to, uh, you know, you have to mix the zombie genre in to get get done what he wanted to do. You know, yeah. it's unfortunate. But, uh, yeah, and in the end, he couldn't even get that done. He discovered after survival that World War Z kind of fucked things up because now zombie films were two hundred million dollar movies, and the market kind of there was a schism in the marketplace where. You could do a two hundred million dollar zombie movie or a two hundred thousand dollar zombie movie. <laughs> the mid range yeah. completely disappeared, and that's where George needed to operate. And there just wasn't even financing for that anymore because it wasn't like Survival of the Dead came out and he was just like, "Well, I'm done." He tried to get dozens of different projects off the ground after that, but it was just the market really became. It was just sort of, you know, it was like allergic to that kind of project and. Uh, it just never happened, which was really sad because there was, we could have, he, he had tons of different ideas that I think would have been great, but, you know, it just, it never seemed to work out. We want to get into the chat real quick, give everybody some shout outs. It's in here. We've got Crash 517, Ryan is in the house, Magic Hands, Stuntman Mark putting over Timothy Hutton's performance as Thad Beaumont and George Stark. Hmm. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Mm-hmm. Robert Scott, Noah Sedrit, Robot House. What is going on? I, I don't remember that name. <laughs> there. Robot that House. Name. Robot oh, House. <laughs> Robot House. That sounds like a fucking like a Fred Olin Ray movie. Robot, Robot House. house. <laughs> or it sounds like a song. <laughs> Whose House? Robot, Robot House. Robot House. <laughs> Donnie Aldridge, Basement Blues, Saturn Video, Bradley Taylor, Hooks, Pop Culture Cafe, brother. 
Alfa Romero is in the house, of course. Uh, Kay Lewis is on Twitch. Well, we are live on Twitch. Nobody knows it but her. Mm. <laughs> we don't have we don't have many Twitchers out there. But uh, appreciate you joining us on Twitch. Big Crack Rock is out there. That's one of Uncle Bill's favorites. Yeah, love and, Big Crack and, uh, Rock. Movie Junkie John. Robert Ream said he's been through two marriages while listening to Dead <laughs> Kid. What does that have to do with? He's been, is, he's been I'm through. on the same marriage, entire run of Dead Pit. <laughs> I like that. Like, hey, boys, I've been on two mar- I'm going on two marriages now. It's just what you need to know. I've had Why? two kids during Dead Pit. <laughs> like, <laughs> Uncle Bill's had like Not 57. Oh, yeah, you've had like I've 62 actually, kids, man. I've actually had like three kids yeah, since Dead Pit started, so yeah. Jesus. Uh, Ragnar666 says, Dario Argento's Dracula 3D is pretty good. It's just the praying mantis sucks. Look. Is that all that sucks in that? It doesn't even really suck that much. I mean, the praying mantis adds ambiance. Planet CHH is actually in Lexington tonight. He's going to Scarefest. Are are you going, Uncle Bill? I'm not going. I'm I'm going to go Sunday. I've kind of planned to go because that's the only day I have nothing going on so Scare are they still holding it downtown nuts. at that convention center down there yep hmm. yeah but they they take on the entire convention center now wow. if you go on that website and look it's at insane. their guests, i it's a big show now yeah, yeah. it's gigantic you know, wow. i don't want to get anywhere near it it's just me but do they still have like <laughs> half and half with like ghost hunters and shit like that yeah they still got a couple of ghosts like uh, paranormal Dude, guests or whatever they not nearly got... as many They've got so many people. They've got reunions for like four or five different Friday the 13th movies, Return of the Living Dead, Fright Night Reunion. They got like a hundred. Six reunions people. going on there. Yeah. It's Six. inside. Like, yeah, it's nuts. Well. But, uh, yeah, I think we've. Wes Ray is here. Uh, Jake yeah. Courtenhouse. Born to Be Rad is in the house. What is going on? So. <clears throat> Keep burning it up in the chat, boys. Carlos, I see you in there, Carlos. The uh, <laughs> says, they have to say it like Carlos. that. Wait, wait, Carlos, I, I see you, Carlos. Hey, Holmes. Would you like a burrito, <laughs> Carlos? What's up, SA? What's up, man? What the hell did you get that accent for all of a sudden? <laughs> that was. What's, what's fuck is that all about? It's like Joe when he ordered a beer that time at a restaurant. He's, he speaks like perfectly, you know. And then he go, he's ordering a beer. He's like, "Yeah, I think I'll have a Pacifico." It's like, <laughs> where in the hell did that accent come from? All of a sudden, I would like to have a Dos Equis. Yeah. <laughs> I hate when white people do that shit where they think they're being cool by really heavily <laughs> pronouncing right. Spanish items. Like, yes, I will have the chicken fajitas. Yeah. I'm like, calm oh, down, no. just calm Cass- down. I always say, just to like embarrass people, Casa Dealers. That's what I'll have. Mm-hmm. Oh, I heard Chicken two women once pronounced fajitas at, at a table next to mine as fajitas. I don't know what the fuck. I don't know what the fuck a fajiti is. Yeah. It's a delicacy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get into these movies. We're going to start oh. because they. And here's the thing too. I don't know if you guys realize this. Thank you, Robert Reams. Cheers to you, brother. We have never reviewed these movies ever on Dead Pit. Really? They, neither one of these mm-hmm. movies. Yeah. I can't believe y'all haven't done a Romero retrospective and just run through the whole filmography. But, yeah, I mean, you talked but, to George for once, what was that, like five, six hours or something like that? I remember you set that call up with you guys. It was it was like an hour and a half, two hours, maybe, something like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure we mentioned them, but like as far as like actually technical reviews go, I don't yeah. think... Because like there was that one initial release for Bruiser and then the Screen Factory blu-ray was what that was when we weren't even doing a show i don't yeah think, that was that between point. it was like, during your hiatus like 2014 i think <laughs> what yeah. the fuck is that fellas your yeah. hiatus your your we kind of went away but not really yeah. oh yeah no during that time where you fucking quit <laughs> 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 no, we just went underground that's what happened like uh you know we those emo bands. no yeah. no no you punked out <laughs> Is what she did. No. 
No, you say <laughs> we just went underground, Holmes. <laughs> uh, so no, those. Yeah, I don't I, have I did, the. I, did the other, yeah, I, did those I will not purchase the Screen Factory one, but this is one that Eureka Entertainment did. I think that has everything else on it. We're talking. It about has all the stuff the, that I did on it. Yeah. The Dark Half from nineteen. Yeah. I've seen nineteen ninety one, nineteen ninety two, and nineteen ninety three. I think it finally came out officially in 93, but it was finished. In yeah, like it got 91. held up in a bunch of, it was a bunch of, again, having nothing to do with the movie itself. It became a pawn and a kind of a, just another, uh, Orion's, Orion, George had, did not have a great relationship with Orion on Monkey Shines. And then he got back in business with him again on Dark Half. I almost viewed that like a Lucy in the football kind of thing. No, 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 we promise this time it'll go well. And then, of course, you know, he lands on his back again. But that one, Orion on the dark half had more to do with uh, they were running out. They were about to die, basically. And uh, a whole bunch of shit got caught up in that. And then the movie just kind of it was on the show for almost a year and a half. And um, again, he lost out. And what was it he, on Monkey Shines? Because they had to reshoot the end. He lost out on Pet Cemetery because he was, uh, re- yeah, he was still going right. to do that. And but then they called him back to do reshoots and do the new ending on that, so he couldn't do Pet Cemetery, so that was over. And then there was something else I can't remember with Dark Half that it screwed up something else. You know, it was just it was one thing after another. And he said at the end of the day, I mean, the, that was the worst part of it is I I didn't get to do this because of this stupid thing I had to do. And you know, it was just anyway. Well, here's what I want to know about the Dark Half. Do either of all, of you all know anything about? The Timothy Hutton stuff, because apparently, like mm. working with Timothy Hutton was not like the most pleasurable experience. And I've always been curious as to what exactly happened, or if any, if you knew anything about what happened. I mean, I've got lots I could tell, but Eric, why don't you start on that? That's I, I, I know of one particular incident that uh, I don't know. Maybe Michael, you can elaborate on, but there were there's one scene where he's driving right yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean it's apparently all, all they've cleared off you know three or four miles of road and it's just simply a driving scene where timothy hutton is sitting behind the wheel and apparently you know and it takes a lot of effort to block off that much highway mm-hmm. for him to do it and it's you know it's really just kind of a simple scene and george is kind of a technician likes to shoot things and kind of move along you know especially simple things like this and apparently uh just Timothy Hutton just did not understand uh, what the scene was all about, what his motivation was, what he needed to be doing. And, you know, it ended up uh, resulting in a pretty big blow up between the two of them. And uh, okay, help me out here, Michael. Did it, did it, maybe it shut down for a couple of days. Yeah, things M- apologies had to be made. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, George was telling me about that. I think it might even be on the commentary as well that mm-hmm. he was talking about. Yeah. Cause it, it was, and that was the thing that was frustrating George. It was a simple shot. There was really no acting needed because he's wearing sunglasses. This is a point where Tad Bone was trying to get away and confront George Stark. And he's driving down the road and some cops pass him. And all he has to do is just keep his eye. I mean, there's no acting involved. It's really a technical thing. And there's this huge long stretch of road, you know, and they had to close it off for five miles in another direction. It was kind of, you know, didn't have a lot of time to do it. And, and yeah, Timothy Hutton basically was just like, I'm not feeling it. I'm not in my, you know, and finally, and finally, yeah, George, and George is not, was never the type of person to have a, a blow up on set. That was just not who he was. The most I ever saw him on set with the movies I worked with him was, Hey, come on guys, let's get this going. That type of thing. And that was very brief, but yeah, he had a, he and Hutton had a big blow up. And of course, with Hutton being the sort of the studio money, the, you know, the guy that everyone, the studio picked and wanted in there and everything, they were going to th- kind of take it aside. But then they decided, look, we're so far into production, let's see if we can work this out. And he and Hutton kind of had a, a detente, I guess you could say, and they finally got a, a, you know, a, a meeting together. And from the rest of the production, things went relatively smoothly. But According to him, and to also just about everybody I've ever spoken to on Dark Half, Hutton was pretty much a fucking nightmare on set because he 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 wanted two trailers, one for George <laughs> Stark, one yeah. for Tad Beaumont. Oh come on! He did, he did, and he would blast heavy metal and what have like porno mags in the, the truck. Really yeah, it, he was very, 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 very method. 
he so peaked he peaked at what age 18 or he won an oscar really young right and yeah, oh he ordinary was in people, ordinary yeah. people yeah, yeah that's right yeah. yeah but you know you're the weird here's, what is he here's about lightly fun, though here's the funny thing about this and this was something i we didn't i never knew until we did the commentary and the interview for the blu-ray i almost thought hutton's performance in the film ultimately is very very good yeah. He's he's very solid in both parts and he's very effective. So and even George was like, yeah, it was he- it wasn't the greatest relationship, but at the end of the day, the goods were delivered. So it's like I can't argue too much. But he said we actually had another actor cast, and it was it was a done deal. But the problem became there was an issue with he was going through a divorce at mm-hmm. the time, and there was a problem with his visa to bring him into the country. Something happened there. And we weren't able to get him at the last minute. And so we ended up going with uh, Timothy Hutton. I said, well, who the hell was that? <laughs> I said, G- Gary Oldman. Oh, shit. And I'm like, you telling yeah. me you had 1990-era Gary Oldman in this role? And suddenly I'm just like, oh, I want to travel right now to an alternate dimension where that happened. <laughs> Can you imagine what he could have done? With, I mean, yeah. it's just that was just like... I, oh, so now whenever I look at Dark Half, I'm just like, oh, what could have been? Well, you know? I always kind of thought too. Like, I like the Dark Half. I actually think that it's like a really, a really well made film. But I always kind of thought that he overdid the the Dark Half part. Like, I thought that his George like just, Stark brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I thought that his just regular performance was fine. It was very good. But I always thought he was just a little bit like maybe overacting in those scenes. Well, that's right from the book. That's who he was. Yeah. I mean, he is a larger than life kind of, and that's the whole idea. He's Tad Bowman's idea of this sort of this, rebel, yeah. badass. Even you know? even at that though, okay. So like exactly what you said. Imagine Gary Oldman in the same performance, and I don't think you would have even been able to notice like how like overblown that was. I think he would have played it like. Oh, pretty God, pitch oh, perfect. It's, it's, it's hard to know. It's so mm-hmm. hard to because Gary Oldman could, you know, he could play to the back rows as good with any of them. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Oldman was also capable. I mean, he could just disappear so thoroughly into stuff. I mean, that's just so. Yeah. That's we just I remember Stuart Andrews from uh, uh, was working with Room Morgan at the time. We're both just sitting there after he George told us that, and we're just looking at each other like going. Shit, <laughs> that's. I wish I almost didn't know that because well, now whenever um, I watch the dark half, I'm gonna be yeah. like, oh, "What about uh, Willem Dafoe?" Though I mean, he was apparently the second choice, right? He was one. Of, he was in yeah. the running too, but I think they went with Hutton because they had a, a, pic, a like a two or three picture deal with him for something, or uh, they, you know, it was there was other again politics and stuff that came into play, mm-hmm. and uh, he Dafoe also would have been amazing though. Oh, Defoe mm-hmm. would have. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, again, there's a lot of actors who could have eaten that role alive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, and again, Hutton did I'm just really trying to good... imagine him in that role. It's like, yeah. uh, I just keep seeing think... Green Goblin. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yo, uh, I wait. Wasn't um, part of the plot of this movie, <laughs> though, like the, you know, the alter ego or the assumed name or whatever they call it in writing, that this was based loosely on something that really happened with Stephen King, right? Didn't, wasn't that one of the... the... The impetus for it was, yes, yeah. he was his 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 alter ego was Richard Bachman, and he did that primarily because someone had times that, you know, people are just buying your books because it's Stephen King. They're not really, you know, they he his whole idea was like I think people are responding to my work because I'm Stephen King now. He didn't, and so he wanted to say, well, how about an experiment? I'll write some books under another name and see if they take off. You know, it was almost like a little like a little. Uh, kind of a, an experiment of his. And so he wrote and published several books under the Richard Bachman name. And then someone figured it out. They got a hold of some records in the publisher's office or something to that degree. And they went to Stephen King and said, I know, I know that you're Richard Bachman. And instead of letting this guy kind of hold that over him, he came forward much like Tad Beaumont did and said, Hey, I'm Richard Bachman. Yeah. Um, the whole do it's the whole uh, you know, there wasn't no there was no real Nobody Richard was... Bachman that came to life and tried to kill <laughs> everybody. everybody. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. uh, the real the Richard Bachman that he came up with was much more mild mannered than George Stark was. Uh, but that was the impetus for it. Uh, and and in the movie, Robert Joy, the actor Robert Joy, who was also in Land of the Dead, plays an exaggerated version of the guy who in real life uh, uh, outed uh, yeah. Stephen King. 
as, as Richard Bopper. So that, yeah, the, the, the dark half was inspired by real life events, but certainly is not in any way, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a real life telling of what actually happened. When, when <laughs> I, I have another quick Hutton story. Um, we had, we interviewed, uh, Jeff Monahan, who's oh, in, actually, yeah. he's in both of these, uh, bruiser and in dark half In dark half. He was just one of the cops that come in and try to uh, set up, uh, the phone tap. Mm -hmm. And apparently, you know, just for whatever reason, Timothy Hutton just is like, I don't, I don't understand what he's doing. What's, what's he, is some guy, <laughs> you know, it's just some guy, you know, just operating, you know, unscrewing a phone and screwing the cat back on his, well, I, but help me understand his purpose. You know, it's just like, come mm. on. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of that on set. And also, and also George had issues with the DP <coughs> on that film. Uh, on, oh, yeah. uh, on on Dark Half, who had primarily at that point was known for his collaborations with James Ivory, the, like the Howard Zandon Remains of the Day, those type of movies. He said it was a good DP, but he said he would take an hour and a half to light a bowl of fruit on the table. He would obsess <laughs> over that. And he got into a Honestly, major Honestly, though, like the, the, you know, the movie looks good. Oh, no, the movie looks great. I was going to say that, yeah. The no, it does. And, and George even said later on, when he would, after we watched it again, he said... I feel like I got my, my craft level went up with this and monkey shines. It's like, I feel like I was starting to get a hold of my craft on a technical level. I, I felt like, yeah, these films really, I think I, I felt good about them in terms of the technical side of things. Cause he had to rely on more on other people with these movies, you know, that he had before. And he said, but he said it was still frustrating for him on, on like, like dark half where it's like, while we're here, can we get a shot of the clock? And you know, he always wanted to get as much coverage as possible. But they couldn't do that, you know. Then it was like, no, 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 we have rules and stuff like that. It was frustrating for him that he couldn't operate the way, the loose way that he liked to. So well, that's that what I was wondering. Like, I, I don't know Romero personally or anything, of course, but I, he doesn't strike me as the type of person that would want to spend two hours, like, obsessing over lighting in certain, like, no, areas not, and no. shit like that. No, because he was from the independent world, where it was just like, move or die. You know, yeah. we don't have we don't have the money or the time for this. So get everything we can, cover the shit out of it. Let's move on to the next thing. And so it was a little bit different to go into a world where it's like, no, we need to really. This is exact science and stuff. And George wasn't really not that George was in any way sloppy or didn't obsess over details, but from his perspective, it's like, who gives a shit about the fucking bowl of fruit? You know, I, we could be doing other things. And he got into a big argument with the dp about the lights in the house i remember that he was talking about this at one point in the movie they 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 retreat from their house and they go up to this other house that they have up in the uh the, oh, yeah. you know, the, the forest or whatever the hell it is and when they arrive there the lights are already on in the house and the dp was arguing that the lights need to be on in the house and george was like but nobody's been here they're just getting there. There hasn't been anybody there for months. Why would the lights be on the house? Yeah, but it looks great. I mean, it's really, it's a great shot. It's like, yeah, but again, who's there? I mean, it's just, there's nobody. So they got, and he couldn't make the DP understand. It's like, there's no, can we figure out a way to do it so it doesn't have all these, I mean, there's all these lights were going to be on the house. So who the hell's been in the house all this time? You know, they haven't been up there in months. So he got into, and so he just found himself getting caught up in discussions like that, where it was just like, I don't know, you know, come on. You know, I guess George Wells say, come on. You know, it just, <laughs> this is, yeah. Um, Michael, maybe you know this. Outside of the bird shots that um, oh, yeah. that uh, Tom Dominski did, was there any other second unit on this? There was. Um, there it was. You know, he had. Yeah, Tom was just in charge of getting those bird shots. That was mm -hmm. his. That was his one hundred percent. His response, and he got some amazing stuff. And those those shots. Well, yeah, that's quite a so, bit of the movie, actually. <laughs> well, and, but the, what is, all those shots, whenever you see like all the birds in the trees and they go up and then there's these big waves of birds, just those are all real. None of that CGI. That was all Tom Dubensky out there just figuring out how to get these amazing shots and just following the birds around. Um, but no, they had, I mean, it was by all accounts, a standard crew with, you know, you know, second unit and so forth. Cause George, you know, had done that before. Um, but at the same time, I, I, it's funny with when I watch Monkey Shines and Dark Half, I like those movies a great deal, and I think they're very technically proficient. And they're good stories and terrific acting, and he gets the suspense really effective in several sequences. But there are there is sort of um, they're not. It's not like Night Riders or Creepshow or Dawn of the Dead where I feel more of a personal stamp on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
I think George, both stories are essentially Jekyll and Hyde stories. They're, you know, the, the dark, exploring the, the darker half of one's soul. And, and that was something that definitely appealed to George. But I think with this, he was really trying to ex- take the next step in terms of his, his, his actual raw abilities as a filmmaker. I think he saw those as an opportunity to go, well, what if I'm out of my comfort zone a little bit? And doing something because he also saw at Pittsburgh at the time, a lot of people were leaving. You know, people his 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 band of filmmakers they were starting to flex. You know, go to New York and L.A. and so he's just like, well, I gotta I gotta do something. You know, I, here, I so. do feel like that that maybe Dark Half more so than Monkey Shines feels more like a commercial kind of movie. Mm-hmm. Like it feels much more like yeah, this is something that Hollywood would make at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh no. I mean, I, I can understand. I, I would I would agree that it doesn't have the, the the I wouldn't necessarily right off the bat recognize it as a film that George would would have directed. Yeah. You know, if you didn't right. tell me right off the bat. Yeah. Um but I think George also re- was okay with that. I mean, that's what he he knew going in that this wasn't going to be a uh a, you know, a homegrown project, you know, necessarily. I mean, it was Stephen King, so he had an in on that reg- and that score. And he brought, a, what I recognize in both films is his sense of humor, which was very yeah. wicked at times and very dry and very, um, sometimes very mean. So sometimes there would be a very mean and sort of, because uh, there's there's moments in the in Dark Half especially where it's like, God damn, that's harsh. I mean, that's really, the, the murder of his uh, agent, yeah. mm-hmm. Tanya Alda, that scene is really just like damn you know george could uh you know he 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 was such a scholar of all types of of film and and he he would apply different aesthetics to different films as he went along and dark half it, i think when he looked back on that movie he saw it as a, as an attempt to broaden himself as a filmmaker and maybe it's like well leaving behind certain things they used to do and trying new things you know he was always yeah. wanting to learn that was his his big thing is if i don't learn anything from this why am i doing it you know when this was uh, the last Pittsburgh movie that he did, right? He never did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you think he had any regrets with that? Or I know he lived in Canada shortly, mm-hmm. you know, after this. Did he ultimately say, I want to make one big Pittsburgh zombie movie. I got one more in me or something like that to, you know, to end his career on. Eric, what do you think on that? I mean, if it had been been done earlier, certainly it would have been done in Pittsburgh. I don't think, uh, it, yeah, it was after Land of the Dead when he finally made the move mm-hmm. officially. Uh, he actually became a Canadian citizen. Yeah. Um, uh, it's hard to say because uh, he was, like we said before, he was in the middle of that whole studio deal with uh, his partner, Peter Grunewald, mm-hmm. who really, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, think about him a lot. He's really like the, the Rubenstein of the second half of his yeah. career mm-hmm. outside of Dark Half, right? That Dark Half's the only one he didn't do? Yeah, because or- he didn't do He was an associate producer or co producer on Monkey Shines. Yes, mm-hmm. but he was not on Dark Half. No, I don't believe so. And then he came back with Bruiser and all the projects after that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I mean, at the same time, yeah, I just don't think it would have happened during that decade with the studio system. And then, you know, when they came out, they they did Bruiser. They didn't they didn't uh, try to do a zombie property, and, and that's to his credit because that that was probably always there for him. And he, even when they did um, Dark Half, they were in the middle of doing Night Ninety. I think mm-hmm. he went. I think he uh, went off to. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think he went off to write he was there for the beginning of night 90 then had mm-hmm. to go right dark half. So he kind of left and that's where Tom kind of, there was rumors that he was going to direct it there at the time, I think. Right. But that, I don't think George ever had any intention of directing mm-hmm. night 90. I don't that think never, so. No, that was never, I mean, I'm sure they would have loved for him to, you know, cause you know, Hey, George, remember, but he, George would never have had any interest in directing. A, a, I'm, I think that his whole, it was like creep show too. It was like, he was, Screenplay only. We we'll move on from there. So um, they did film Dark Half in '90, right? Though, so that's why Savini wasn't. Yeah, '90, '91. Patched to... and through there. Yeah. So John they... Bulich, who that the makeup effects in this is really good as well. I did oh, yeah. want to put that yeah. over. 
um, yeah. especially towards Robert the Burrell, end. I think, as well. Yeah, was op- optic nerve, nerve. The optic yeah. nerve. Yeah. yeah, same folk. They did also Night Ninety, right? Yeah, they. Yeah. That was their first gig. Was uh, was as as I think as optic nerve. Their first gig was Night Ninety, mm-hmm. and then they went right into Dark Half after that because Tom had at that point switched his focus into really wanting to direct. So, um, and then, what's interesting is these two films were they were filmed about. 10 miles apart in uh yeah southwestern pa it's about maybe 30 miles southwest of uh of uh Pitts- or pittsburgh mm-hmm. and uh yeah pretty uh, at their romero productions were pretty much occupying the same area for probably a better part of a year or more uh well, shit always- eric i wish i'd known that at the time i would have gone out in them places <laughs> Could've tried to be an well, extra uh, yeah. yeah if no well, if i you- mean i would have gone when i went to pittsburgh like to the well, if you go to the uh, the night ninety graveyard, is literally maybe half a quarter of a mile away from Michael Rooker's sheriff's office uh, oh, in, okay. in Middleton, PA. And what's we uh, we found that location maybe two or three years ago. They still got the decals on the window for the oh, sheriff. Really? Uh, I forget some main. What is it? Some main city. I can't remember. Wow. Castle Rock. Castle Rock. Oh, that's yeah, it. Yeah, cool. they still have the uh, the decals. And, yeah. So I'm yeah, that was though. a weird period. That was a weird time that Night 90 overlap with Dark Half because George was really he Dark Half was difficult almost right from the jump, and his focus was really trying to get that going. And then there's this Night 90 thing going on at the same time, and it just it it kind of divided his focus because he wanted to be there for Tom, but at the same time he had to do this other thing, and it just I think things would have been a lot different had Dark Half happened a year later. I think things would have, uh, certainly in terms of Night 90, probably been a lot smoother in many regards, but, you know, who knows? Who knows? I think they may have missed the sweet spot by that delay because they were Mm -hmm. counting on a Stephen King property to kind of rescue Orion, but then, you know delay it two years and all of a sudden it's it's alongside no one cares anymore yeah because also the... they had robocop 3 at the time they had a whole bunch mm-hmm. of stuff and all of it by the time it came out it all seemed like it had been you know war- you know just like warmed over like reheated soup it was just like oh, well at the so time cool. it was filmed too the the dark half book really wasn't that old at that time either no right? it had just come out were... it had just come out yeah. i think like two years maybe even a year before so it was fresh off the presses. So it wasn't like this one had been kicking around a while. And then it would have been fresh off of the the It miniseries too. And Stephen King's right. name was gigantic. Yeah, at that time. Uh, but his name is interesting, though. It, I think Dark Half got a lot of uh, heat and probably came into into you know theatrical reality because of what Pet Cemetery did in '89. Mm-hmm. That was a huge hit. And it revitalized Stephen King's name in the theatrical marketplace because it had been kind of coming, kind of falling off a little bit at that point. And all of a sudden, oh, Stephen King, Stephen King! But by the time '93 rolls around, situation is totally different. He had begun to shift more towards miniseries and TV, and theatrically speaking, there really weren't that many King adaptations around at that time, and no one really. And also, the marketing campaign for Dark Half was weak; it was very, very weak. It was. Um, I mean, everyone likes, I mean, that purple poster is really cool and all that, but the, you see the trailers and everything, and it's like, you don't really get much of a sense of what the movie is. It's a bad trailer, yeah, I it's remember It's not a good trailer. trailer, and it's not a good ad campaign, but it's also, it's very much ind- indicative, I think, of a an ad campaign from a studio who's on the way out the door, you know? And let's be like, honest, oh, who, who wants to see a movie that stars Timothy Hutton? I mean, he, he's not. <laughs> I agree, God, man. Damn. I agree. <laughs> In that in that era, for sure, maybe really coming first, out hard on Timothy. He was ten, like, ten years past his prime. I mean, yeah, he was, I mean, at that he point, wasn't I mean, a name really at that point. No one really, yeah, it's no, it's not that anyone hated him or anything. It's just that no, he wasn't going to open a movie. I know? can't remember the last thing like Turk one eighty two or something before that. Mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, it's been yeah. He'd been consistently. He had done a movie called Everybody's All American for, or I believe that was also. With, for uh, Dennis Quaid and Dennis uh, Quaid. That was a good movie. Shall, yeah, uh, and I think that he tried to get some awards heat off of that. That didn't happen. And then, um, you know, it's just the ups and downs of a career. But yeah, he wasn't gonna. No, that movie wasn't gonna open with because of Timothy Hutton. It was gonna open because of Stephen King Stephen and King. George. They were yeah. the stars, really, of that movie. But the studio didn't really see it that way, or at least in terms of George, anyway. Well, I'm curious. I mean, you guys have revisited it, or what? What did? CK, what <laughs> what what were your thoughts upon uh... of the of the two movies? This one, I mean, I think this one's underrated at this point. 
I actually enjoyed it. I think it they overall. both are, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's, I'm kind of confused as to why this isn't talked about more often. Um, you know, it's definitely, I think, one of the, I don't know if it's forgotten, but you don't, like, when you talk about Romero movies, it's always the dead movies or creep show, usually, like, mm-hmm. you know, nine times out of ten. So, I mean, he does have some interesting titles, and I'm glad I revisited this because it had been so long. You know, I think I may have rented it on the VHS back in the day. That's how long ago. Uh, I, That's how it, most it people saw it, it back then. Yeah. They sure as hell didn't see it in the theaters. You know. the but I enjoyed it. I, me... I think that the cast in it, other than Timothy Hutton, was pretty good. Amy Madigan. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Michael Every, Rooker, I think everyone Amy in the movie Madigan, is terrific. Yeah, yeah I think. You know, Michael Rooker is really great. And, yeah. Um, you know, and I do, I really do think Timothy Hutton's very good in the film. It's just, for me now, knowing the history of everything, it clouds my judgment a little bit when I watch it. I can't help it because it's like, I wonder if he and George, is it because there were times where I, I just don't think Timothy Hutton had any faith in George or whatever. I don't know what was going on. And I guess, you know, Hutton was kind of in on his own head. And I've heard that from many people who work with him, that he's very, very method like over the, like really like, it's like, Oh, you gotta be kidding me method almost. And so I think, and George, to some degree, George will tolerate that sort of thing. But it's like when it starts interfering with other people's ability to get the job done, like it was on that one car shot, it's like, give me a break, you know? So that was frustrating for him. Yeah. And he's, he's worked with Ed Harris. So he knows what it's like to. Yeah. But Ed, yeah, but Ed knew, yeah, but Ed would, you know, take it out on himself more than anybody else. You know, Ed was like, you know, the, the, there's that great story on Night Riders where he was so frustrated at one point, he started punching the gas tank of the of the motorcycle that he's on. And there was someone underneath the motorcycle because they were doing a tracking shot on the back of a trailer. And he's like underneath, and here's Ed Harris punching this <laughs> gas tank. And the guy's like, Ed, 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 Ed. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, okay. But Ed, I mean, I've never heard, I've heard about how intense, but you'll not, I don't think you'll find any stories out there about Ed being impossible to work with. You know, it's just that he's a very passionate guy. <laughs> what the hell? We got Where a slavery. Boys at- wow, wow, that's a really... Damn. God damn, okay. <clears throat> he's been a real deal, I love Chad Hoochie. The, um, the success, or I mean, Orion finally, what, after two years, released it. Mm-hmm. What did it do box office-wise? That's one thing I really... Practically I guess nothing. anything. Yeah. Hold on, I can tell you exactly what it did. Yeah, I think it made a couple mil. Maybe it did. Mil, so it did ten million on a fifteen million dollar budget. Yeah, it didn't do very mm. much at all. It was. Um, it didn't open very big, and it disappeared after a couple of weeks. Because I remember it opened. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time, and I went and saw it opening weekend. It played two weeks in the first run, did one week in the second run, dollar houses, and <laughs> gone. Yeah, it was just out. Because by that point, Orion didn't have the money to keep it in the theaters anyway. And they knew at that point they knew it wasn't going to save them. So curiosity, though, that while I've got this on my mind, you sat with Romero at conventions a few times over the years. Did mm-hmm. anybody ever bring him shit from the dark half or Bruiser to have signed? I guarantee they did. Yeah, I guarantee uh, it, they did. Yeah, I mean, it certainly wasn't on the level of Dawn of the Dead or any of these other stuff. But every now and then, someone would bring a Bruiser VHS. I remember a lot, a surprising amount of Bruiser VHSs, which surprised me because I didn't remember. That, you know, that didn't get a whole lot of distribution or at the time, or certainly didn't seem to. But Bruiser did, and Dark Half, um, I would say out of all the, yeah, Dark Half, Monkey Shines, and Bruiser were certainly at the bottom of the ones that would come up. But periodically, yeah, they would. Every show had at least two or three, at least. I mean, because there was always somebody that was just like they wanted that. And I think yeah. some people would bring Bruiser because it was like they knew that George really was passionate about and liked that movie and it was sort of the neglected offspring and so it would you know and george would always bright i was like ah bruiser you know so and then there's people like matt blasey would bring him the polish poster for fucking bruiser because you know matt's obsessed with this movie and so it's like oh my god it was a huge hit in poland yeah i was just like where did you find it's like this is the crimea fucking poster for what the fuck is this I mean, Matt. Matt's. If Matt Blasey were here right now, he would probably whip out his Bruiser collection, which yeah. has every territory that that movie was ever released in, even if only two people saw it. You know, it's just like, how did I didn't know this thing opened in Chad? You know, <laughs> 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 guys. If you got one of the 
the hand painted posters that's from like, like Pakistan. Oh, from like Ghana or, whatever, or something like that. Yeah. It's like on a, on a flower sack. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, don't, I don't think Bruiser ever got that trade, but you know what? If it did, Matt's got one. I guarantee I wish you. I, I wish I'd brought it in here, but I actually got a dark half laser disc signed by Stephen King. Really? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and a creep show. He was doing a book signing oh. and a speaking engagement kind of deal. And I, yeah. Wow. I, That's I, cool. I'll be honest with yeah, you, though, like, I actually think when it comes to Romero films, like, the ones that he did that weren't dead movies are more interesting to me now than the ones that for the, of the dead movies. Like, it used oh, sure. to be that, like, you know, I was, like, all about Night, Dawn, Day, you know, all those movies. But, I mean, if you look at, like, the other stuff that he was doing, especially the stuff that he was doing, like, in the 70s, mm-hmm. like, that stuff is just insanely original, like, yeah all of it martin not yeah, riders brother. um yeah well, I, are... we may do another episode on on some of those and there's, that's, and there's so them. much and there's so much to talk about because the george romero that existed in the early 70s and into the late 70s wasn't the george romero doing dark half and monkey right Shines. right that guy was he was almost like a, a beat poet in a way in terms of the way he would <laughs> yeah he was, he was yeah. And, and he was an editor he was a hands-on editor back then so when you would watch something like season of the witch He's in there, like with the celluloid cutting and putting stuff over his shoulder, and and just he's grooving on. It's almost like a DJ in a way. Yeah, you know, trying to figure out the momentum and just trying to, you know, there's a sequence in there's season of the witch where he goes, she's in the store, and there's all these quick cuts, and it's very disorienting, and it's just like you can literally see a filmmaker just going, let's see if this works, you know, let's see mm-hmm. if this does this track. And uh, recently with uh, the discovery of amusement park, same thing. That was a yeah. that was a work for hire gig, but George being George, he couldn't just shoot something out, you know, and take the money. He was just like, "What what can I do with this idea?" And he comes up with this very hallucinogenic, very oddball, you know, little movie. Which I'm sure when the Lutheran Church got a hold of it, went, "Well, this is a little bit more intense than we originally thought <laughs> yeah. was going to be." Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, it's so it's yeah that's. It's it. There's there's a different George Romero depending on when you talk about him because his his career evolved and then also he went back to being sort of that loose guy later in his career. Yeah, because I feel like and, and stuff. I feel like in that time period, uh, a lot of those movies were kind of his own, literally his own vision of kind of like yeah, either a were, reality were, that he wanted or a reality right, that, they were homegrown. Yeah, they yeah, were pros. literally yeah. you know yeah they were his ideas. He wrote yeah. them. He edited them. He directed them, um, and they were his. They were his babies. You know, that it's about as close to as an auteur as you can get. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah. you you have to have Two other people working on it. Real quick here, that Wes Ray mentions different cuts of the dark half, mm. and the Martin thing, which that we were talking about that a little oh. bit the last time. The the three hour cut. Have you heard well, it's anything? It's not three hour. New? That's a, that's a misnomer. That's not. Yeah, the the well, um, I, it's good to talk about the Martin thing because th- there's been some developments. Like, there's only so much we can talk about, I think, Eric. But uh, um, what what? It's only weird... so much I know. I I just know yeah. we. I know the archive has it, and they plan mm-hmm. to restore it, and that's yeah. about it. Yeah, that was weird. It was a weird situation because that that print. So many legends around that print for years. Where did it go? Who had it? It was it lost in a flood? Was it left at a theater? Was it left with such and such? And to find out it was actually left with these people that they were scouting locations for night riders, I think, at the time. And they had brought this movie to show these people and they left it there. They say George gifted it to them. Of course, I find say that, that very though. unlikely that that would have <laughs> happened. The, that's like a Judge Judy episode or something. Yeah, it's yeah. a gift. But yeah. I think it was left there certainly by I mean certainly by accident. It wasn't like they stole it. I think George left it there or someone left it there. So if you want to watch the movie again, and we'll get it back at one some point or another. Well, forty years later, it's theirs. I mean, they own it now. And so they finally come forward and say, "Hey, we have this print," and then they realize they had something that was probably worth something. And I don't know what happened if there were any negotiations between Richard Rubenstein who owns the intellectual rights to Martin uh, in terms of getting it back. But one thing led to another and they put it up for auction and the thing sold with fees and everything over $50,000. And, uh, but there was a very, and I, I, I'm not in a position where I can name who this was, but there was a very, very generous, kind hearted 
wonderful human being who is the one who bought it and is the one that's donating it to the Romero Foundation. And so he, because he, and I, my concern was, and I'm sure Eric would agree, is that I, it's like, whoever buys this thing, it's going to end up on some collector's shelf, like at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark or something, <laughs> and we're never yeah. going to fucking see it, you right. know, because whoever buys it didn't own any rights to exploit it. Same, they could, same is true for the archive. We, they have yeah, they no don't. rights to do anything yeah. with it. But at least we know where free, it is. Maybe? Yeah. Um, I mean, they might be, maybe, but you know, with Richard, who knows, but with, right. uh, right. But at least, at least we, we know where the print is. And yeah. it's safe and secure and with the right people. And so we don't have to want, so that's, that was the main thing. It's just so, but it's, so it's, it's safe and it's secure. Thank God for that. At least I just wish Damn George dude. was still, cause that was one big thing. George always wanted that to find where that went. And, uh, it, I just wish he was still around to see that it's been found. I think he would have delighted. What the fuck? That. I hope that's not true. What? It says the woman who had it was from Berea, Kentucky, from what I heard. <laughs> that's probably true because who the fuck else would know anything about Berea, Kentucky? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't, right know, down. I don't know. I don't know much about the people except that they were living on a property that George and I think Mike Gornick and Richard Rubin or somebody went out to scout as a location for either Night Riders. Or maybe at that point could have even been Dawn of the Dead. I don't know, um, but it was. Uh, um, and then was it print uh, got left there? Greg Nicotero did he buy it? Donate it? I don't know. You know it was. No, I really, shit. No, I'm, uh, no, I'm not saying you personally know. I'm just saying that in general, who's well, a guy? Knows. Yeah, who's well, a guy that has a shit ton of money that not, could buy it oh, and no, like cares about Romero films? Oh, I mean, uh, he's I, he would certainly be someone I would think would be a candidate yeah. for that sort of thing, sure. But I don't know. I don't know who it is. It was they, if they're keeping that under lock and <laughs> Earth key, Girls, so I don't know. Yeah, Earth Girls are yeah, easy. Or, yeah. Out oh, anymore. listen. You know, the thing is, I could tell you, <laughs> I could tell you who it is, and you probably wouldn't believe me if I did know. I, I could tell you, and you'd be like, oh, it was, yeah. Also, you know, trick or treat. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton did it. Ed Harris. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm no, honestly, I I I'm waiting for more information to come out on what it actually is because I do know at one point Richard soured on it and mm -hmm. kind of said, "Yeah, that's not even what you're saying. It is that's some kind of answer print." He was trying to belittle it. I don't know how serious he was. If that was a negotiation tactic or what? I think he, it was a negotiation tactic. He cause... he did back off though. He he completely unattached himself from it. Said, "Eh." Do whatever you want with that. I don't need that. Yeah, I, I don't know what Richard's attitude toward. I mean, I can't speak for him because no, well, no one but Richard can speak for Richard. Yeah. Um, but I, based on, I mean, Mike Gornick saw it. He exact, you know, saw pictures of the said that's that's the one. That's it. And there wouldn't have been a whole bunch of these things floating around out there anyway. Yeah. Um, and the you know the so it's yeah it's it's unquestionably what it was. And then well, and the story I... checked out too, so it was just like, yeah. And they, they had posted some uh, scans, I guess they've done, of the uh, some of the film. And it, mm -hmm. it was a different uh, intro graphics. So, yeah. Yeah, so it had to be. It. Yeah. It's clearly It's it. all but black and white, know, right? The whole movie. Yeah, the whole thing is in black yeah. and white, you know. Yeah, it was just a, it was a, it, oh. they just knocked it off at the time as something to show people to, hey, to get financing for the next thing, you know, because it's like, uh, it was, it's, it's. I'm just hoping. But it was fully, you know, it was fully finished, though. It was just, you know. They just did it in black and white, probably to save money more than anything else. Eventually, we'll get to see some of this stuff, you know. Maybe I don't know. We'll get I, that Martin will come out. Something will happen. They'll at some yeah. point. Who God only knows when. But for me, I can at least rest easy at night knowing it's safe and secure with the right people. The yeah. um, and not on other a collecting thing. shelf, like yes. you said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, collecting dust. The mm -hmm. um. Tales from the Dark Side. We were talking about that too. That's another project that's, you know, it'd be very expensive, but you would be willing to help out with as far as re edits and all that stuff. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, the else? problem, oh, the, the series, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem with the series is that, uh, yeah, it was shot on film. Uh, and, uh, but it was all mostly, I think it was all 16 millimeter. And, but the, the company that owns it has all the original film has all the original AB roll negative for every episode, but you have to reassemble that shit. And the problem is you got to get in there and you got to cut and each, 
each shot has additional few seconds on either end. So you need to line up every single shot to make sure it matches. That's quite a bit of work. I just did that for a movie that Vinegar Syndrome, or one of, part, one of their partner labels, is releasing. And you have to, it's, I had to re, reposition and recut every single shot from that movie. Speaking of which, um, this is unrelated to, uh, but there's some, there was some really wonderful news today that got announced. Um, Agfa, who oh, yeah. released Effects on Blu-ray, they found the original negative for Effects. And uh, they're going to do a, a new 4K uh, UHD uh, of that. And that was wonderful news because I, that's great. We didn't, I can't wait for that. Cause I, I love I, that movie is dear, near and dear to my heart for a lot of reasons. Uh, but the fact that they actually were able to locate the original 16 millimeter negative for that, and they're going to go in and we're going to see a brand new transfer because I mean, that's, that's wonderful. So I'm really, I was just, was wanting to, uh, just celebrate that. That was a great thing to wake up this morning and see. Yeah. Michael, I also wanted to thank you. Speaking of cutting together things, you you cut together that extended season of The Witch or uh, Jack's Wife. Thank oh, you yeah. for that. That's oh, fucking yeah. amazing. I mean, that, oh, yeah. that's awesome, dude. I, that was I'm... that took some doing because we didn't have very good source material on that extra stuff. What was they, it like a, ma- a, a one inch tape or something? I think it was even a two inch. It might have been. It was uh, it was something that there was only like one player left in Los Angeles that could actually <laughs> process this, and they had to take like I picture them going into like this long hallway. And a, and a cover and taking the cover off and dust flies everywhere and they had to hand crank it to get it to work again um but yeah they actually did a transfer and then i had to up res it and reposition it and sort of ma- figure out when to go in and out of scene so i didn't you know and then it had to be some color it was rough it was a little bit rough but it was an honor to do that because uh, the longer version of season is really it's really in my view the only one to watch yes the short I agree. one doesn't do that doesn't do I agree that movie justice so that was thank you for that. I, I, that nah. was a lot of fun to work on that one, and I, again, I felt like the, I had a calling. I must, I must fix this. It's, it's this is Romero. This must be done, but who knows? So maybe, and I, and I guarantee you, someday someone's going to be like, "Hey, we found this sixty millimeter footage in my garage. It says Season of the Witch. All the stuff that was cut out of those versions. It's like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> it's been sitting here this whole time. Can't wait. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know you can't wait, but no, I want to see yeah. the end result. Exactly, I want to. Yeah. I want somebody to find the source material for elves so they can do a four K. <laughs> elves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, Dan Haggerty's long gone, so I can't. You Dan Haggerty so. smoking did those Winston's in four K. I think Dan Haggerty's got yeah, Dan Haggerty passed away. No yeah. way. I mm. think he did. I think he did. It's all them cigarettes. That movie was financed by Marlboro. That's for sure. Somehow mm. or another. <laughs> the um, continuing on though, we got one more movie. And listen, I just want to take a moment before we discuss this movie to say that we have talked shit about this film. Yeah, you have. For the past (laughs) 16 years. And I went back and watched it. I probably have not seen it for 15 or 16 years, I would say. And um, I got a new appreciation for it that I did not have. And... uh, I don't know what your experience was with it again, CK. I don't know if you have any new appreciation for it, but it's a it's a really, really um, creative and interesting movie. It really is. Yeah, for me, um, I don't think I think this was the first time I watched the movie in its entirety. Like all the times before, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't Bruiser like on IFC Channel a lot back in the day? It might have been. Be. It might have been. That may be where I've tried to watch it originally, but uh, you know, I mean, it's not the worst. I've definitely seen a lot worse. I I watched that uh, the reborn Jeepers Creepers movie today. Jesus Christ, that may be <laughs> that may be the worst movie I've watched since the Dead Pit revival. Boys. I'm not kidding. Wow, I think it, Jesus, that is one of the bottom of the barrel. I got to try to do a review on that, but uh, yeah, Bruiser. I mean, it's got some interesting stuff in. It. I think it's it's got some the the mask itself is very creepy, like it's mm-hmm. unsettling for some reason. And then the entire movie also plays kind of like a nightmare dream mm-hmm. sort of feel throughout the entire movie. Like it's you know it's not perfect at all, but I think of of all of Romero's movies, it's probably like one of the more bizarre, interesting takes, you know, what do you guys mm-hmm. think? 
Yeah, Eric, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I remember when it came out and I saw the art, this artwork. Mm-hmm. That, and, uh, you know, I kind of was, I was intrigued thinking it was going to be kind of a, maybe even kind of a slasher kind of thing, something mm-hmm. that he hadn't done yet. And I, I really didn't like it at first. I, uh, I was incredibly disappointed with it. Um, it definitely had a Canadian... I mean that in the the bad way, the mm-hmm. Canadian, the, the Canadian in the bad it, way feel. It looks kind of cheap. I mean, honestly. Yeah, it's, it's a little hilarious. inexpensive, and I think when you're down on a film, you can really kind of pick out a couple of things that you didn't like and just completely write it off. And I kind of did that for a while, but it's uh, I can say the same thing. And it's a movie that it parallels in many ways is uh, Mar- George Romero's Martin. Mm-hmm. Um, another film that I didn't like right away. Uh, Mm -hmm. didn't, you know, it took a couple of viewings to really kind of stick with me, but yeah, I mean, I, I've been a big fan of this film for years. Um, I, um, it's, it's refreshing to see George come back and do something. George like, it doesn't feel like a studio film. It's definitely feels like a, almost a George Romero auteur piece where he, he had control of every single element story, direction editing you know um it, it does miss in a couple of spots but i it's a it's a grower i every time i watch it i watched it today with the commentary on and uh i i love this movie i i mean outside of my my co-host matt blasey i think i'm the number two fan in the world on this thing <laughs> <laughs> but i no, i'm i'm a big fan i i love uh peter stormare hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's a great uh, Tom Atkins. Uh, yeah. great as always. He's and, a cop, uh, man. As long as he's a cop in a movie, you know, you can't go wrong. <laughs> Agreed. But uh, yeah, no, I I think this is uh, it's it's due for a uh, a special edition. I have this thing. I got this from Germany. Yeah, and, I've got that uh, one too. Oh, I had that one actually. I sold it to Matt. I think. <laughs> It's not uh, that great, but upon revisiting the Lionsgate DVD, I might need to pop this in it because at first I thought this might have just been kind of an interlaced kind of upgrade mm-hmm. thing, but it, it might be a little better than I might be remembering that wrong because the uh, the blue the ninety nine or two thousand Blu Ray it didn't it didn't no. look that good this afternoon. No, it didn't. <laughs> well, the, uh, Lionsgate did the DVD. Do they still own the movie or what's the? Well, it it was they they, they bought it from Studio Canal. Studio Canal financed the movie. And they uh, they like the Lionsgate picked it up. Yeah, they still have it, and um, it is one that I am very much pushing for as a Vestron release. Oh hell yeah! Um, oh yeah, that'd be amazing. Because uh, it I, it needs a new transfer. It needs a new 4K transfer. Yeah, for one it does. Because it's just the lighting in that movie is very specific. Because it seems it's almost what I, I I when I first saw the movie, I went to a screening at the Cisco Film Center in Chicago when George was there. I just started at Anchor Bay back in like 2000 and he had a screening of it there and I was sent there as like an emissary from Anchor Bay to be like, hey George, we're, I'm from Anchor Bay and we're getting to do all your movies so we just you may be hearing from us. And also I was the, the biggest fan in the world so I was just like, oh my God. And uh, I ended up going out to dinner with him that night when the whole bunch of people wow. and we talked. It was really amazing night. But I saw Bruiser there and I had sort of a similar reaction. I liked it but it was like, I really didn't know what to make of it. I was just kind of like, this is, uh, this movie doesn't proceed in a, in a fashion that I was either really ready for or used to. And it's a very cold film. It feels very cold. It feels antiseptic at times because even All the his sets. house, yeah, the yeah, set, even his house yeah. is very white and beige and sort yeah. of uh, yeah. mono, almost monochromatic at times. And it's like, but then I realized later watching the movie, it's like, well, that, that's deliberate because that's yeah. his life. It's very beige and very bland and very yeah. lifeless. And unfinished, more... by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, which is why I think the movie needs a new transfer because it's a very different, you need to really be careful when you do the color correction on a film like this because if it's not it's too dark or too bright, it ruins what George was trying to go for with it. And I think the Canadian aspect of it sort of helped it because it just made it, everything seem a little bit sterile at first and it was just like you know and so it's not it's and and i and looking back at it now it's an angry film too Mm -hmm. it's a very mean very edgy film certainly i think the meanest one that he george ever really did 
And I think a lot of it came from his frustration over those last eight or nine years prior to Bruiser where he couldn't yeah. get anything done. And well, I it's kind that, of a movie about like a guy getting just screwed over in every way possible. And that, right. I guess, probably mimics what he was going through at the time. And, yeah, and I, and <laughs> Feeling and like and that. I, well, I asked George about that. And he said, I don't think that was ever consciously in my mind. But it's like, and it probably wasn't. But I can't help it. It, it definitely fed into it. And it's, uh, it's not a film that is... It's, you can't it's not it's not warm and cuddly it's not a no. it's not one of george's films where you just like oh i love you want to wrap your arms around it bruiser's kind of like okay i respect you but stay the fuck away from me it's really <laughs> kind of, yeah it's it's got kind of an edge to it but i have grown to really love it over the years too primarily because there's nothing else in this filmography really like it mm-hmm. although I tell it, you, it, you know it does it also has a jekyll and hyde element to it, it as does. well yeah but this one's more of the id the inner id coming out to play when I, that's who he really is you know and trying to get away with it because he's nobody the mask represents yeah. that he's nobody now and i i really it just, just was you know just out of curiosity was that was the name all of the film always Bruiser, or was that yeah. something that? Yeah, it was always okay. Bruiser, as far as I know. Because I think like the marketing and like just the the name of the movie too. I think that that I heard it more than anything. Maybe yeah, they I didn't know how to. It, they didn't really know how to. I mean, honestly, it didn't get much of a, it. Got it, we got. I always joke with George is like that movie escaped. It didn't really get released because yeah. it also got kind of just bought and thrown out there it didn't get much of a campaign i mean the artwork for it's okay but it looks almost like a lifetime movie i think it, I yeah it, it looks very generic somehow yeah, like there's the something problem. about it, needed, it yeah it needed, and i but again that face is a, is a great image but i don't think they really used it in a very effective way but it, it would be great to revisit that movie and get it because i think people have finally started to discover it and really yeah. are, are kind of like wow this is not well is, i, I can honestly see why think... people reacted to it the way they did there's a lot of people that have still never heard of it. They probably mm-hmm. don't even know it exists. It's uh, not just, widely uh, available yeah, either. I, no, I think you no. have to be at a certain point in your life to appreciate that movie too. But I don't yeah. think like you can be in your twenties and really understand exactly what's going on in that movie. Like you have to kind of be further along and, and gone through some shit to really get like, cause I think we've all, that think we've all felt like that at our points where it's like, is anyone even, does anyone even know I exist? Does anyone, would yeah. the world even miss me if I were gone? And this guy is getting just punched and punched and punched, like figuratively and you know, and, and metaphorically over and over and over again. Yep. And then suddenly he, and this mask shows up on his face and he realizes, oh, I don't have to pretend anymore. Yeah. I don't have, the, the, the facade is gone. I can be well, whoever the, I want to be. The boiling point, now I think this would drive anybody mad, is, is his wife jerking off his boss. Right. <laughs> in front of him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and a guy who he hates more yeah. than yeah. life itself. The and Stomer is so Stomer is so yeah. much fun to watch. Yes. And at one point he starts he hops up on the table and just starts humping the air and it's just like I wonder if George even knew he was gonna do that. Because it was just like so he's like, all right, we'll keep that in the movie. What the hell? I don't know what the There was a lot on. of stuff he did in that movie where I almost guarantee it was improvised because oh, it just I'm, seemed yeah. yeah. Yeah, but well, he like had the, a great. Uh, he when he a, shows his crutch in the board meeting. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he had, a, and I asked him. I said, "Was he was was Stormy difficult?" He said, "No, Peter was a delight. He loved Peter. So he had a great time working with him on that." He said, "That was a situation where he got into character, but I could still talk to the guy between takes. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. just like, and he and also he really understood the guy. So when he would go off on these little things, it was like, oh yeah, that's that's great. You know, George." George loved it when an actor would so get into something and then add something of his own that was right in line with that character. And George delighted in that. He was never someone who was like, stick to what I wrote, goddammit. You know, that wasn't him at all. <laughs> you know, so, but it was, it was a matter of if you're holding up the whole damn show and nothing's coming of it, that's a big problem. And so he lo- but you now he loved actors. He loved working with people like that. And he had a good, he had from, Everything that I remember talking to him about, he had a really good time on that movie because, again, he was making a movie after a long period of getting this close to doing something. He was making it under his own steam, his own power. No one was telling him what to do, and he got to make the movie that he wanted. And so what more can a filmmaker like him ask for? Yeah. In um, a way, when I watched it this time, it really put me in mind of like, um, like a supernatural version of Falling Down. 
Yeah, like, it is. It has yeah. some relation to that. Certainly does. Yeah, where you're just like, fuck this. I don't give a shit. You know, I'm going to rebel against all this crap in society that's pissing me off. But it's yeah. also reflecting the fact that inside you're empty and confused and there's something missing in your life yeah. and you're venting on, on, on other people. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a very complex film. I, you know, I have my own issues with it. I don't think the big club finale works as well as it should. It yeah. doesn't stick the landing. Yeah. It doesn't quite stick the landing. And I, I, it was, you know, I don't know why that, although it's funny where they filmed that, that club finale was in this district of, uh, of, uh, Toronto called the distillery, which at the time was largely abandoned and nobody went down there and they were able just to take over this one little warehouse building and build this whole club set in there. Now the distillery, which was like two blocks from where George ended up living for the rest of his life is like the hippest area in fucking Toronto <laughs> shops, restaurants, everything you, it's like the, it's, it's some, and I've eaten at restaurants down there and I've and everything. And it's like the hippest crazy that whole area where that was has been so completely revitalized you couldn't rent warehouse space down there for a million bucks i mean it's because there isn't any space left so it's always funny whenever i watch bruiser it's like man that's like six shops now this whole this whole (laughs) this whole set is like and they're making they're making hand money hand over fist down there now but back then it was just the it was the old distillery district that no one knew what to do with so they were able to go down there and do whatever he wanted I'm curious the, though. Uh, the, what, the, what the tail end Romero... of the movie too, real quick, like the very end of the movie where he gets another job, mm-hmm. and like I don't, I don't think that that needed to be added at the end either. That didn't really fit. Yeah, with the rest of the movie. <laughs> Excuse me. I uh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. The ending of the film doesn't quite, for me anyway, isn't the strongest aspect of it, and I think that may be why some initial reactions to it were not as great as it could have been because it's funny if a movie does its job for 90 percent and doesn't quite hit the end that's going to leave the impression with you that it's not maybe that great a film yeah. whereas a bad a film that's not that great but somehow comes out of nowhere and sticks the landing you may walk out thinking that's the greatest film you ever saw because that's your the last impression you have of it um and and bruiser yeah i'm not sure if i'm not entirely sure if the ending works for me that much either but i think it does had- if they had yeah. done something similar to the beginning of like Suspiria and right. they just rolled the credits. Yeah, you know, really. Just stopped and rolled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, not really... I, think, I think that might have been his, you know, his imagination on that. You know, he might have thought in his head that's mm-hmm. what it would have turned out to be. Yeah, because um, yeah, because the movie plays with is this all in his head? Is he how much of this is he really is re, is he really doing or is he projecting out there what's going on? And that's hard to wrap that up. That's hard to, mm-hmm. to put a bow on something like that without literally just going, fuck it, you make up your own mind, you know? Yeah. Whereas on, like on Martin, there's some of that too. But George found a way in with that where at the end, you can debate that all you want, but it really doesn't matter. Martin still ends up where he was going to yeah. end up anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and I, that's, one of the, that's one of my favorite things about Martin is, was he really a vampire or not? In George's well, mind, like, the first time I saw it, I thought he was a vampire and I right. hated it. But once you consider that, it's like, this is fascinating. And it's, yeah. I think that's uh, something that I don't think we've mentioned yet is the mask real or not. That's the element right, exactly. that I think yeah, yeah. elevates this film. Is are other people, and I think outside of the, the newspaper landing on the ground with his image on it, that's mm-hmm. the only real evidence that the mask is real. Yeah. And some people um, don't react to it the way that you would think they should. That was you my know? thing watching it too. I was like, so nobody really so is, is it reacting to yeah. it. Yeah, like that you would think somebody would freak out if they yeah. saw so that. But it, it, yeah. there's a lot of interesting questions in that movie where you're just like, okay, well, is he is the are we seeing the mask through his eye? You know, we're yeah. seeing the movie through his eyes, but we don't really ever see the action through anybody else's. So yeah, what are they actually seeing? It, yeah, I mean it's 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 a really ch- it's a film worthy of examination and discussion, and I think at yeah. the end that was George's whole thing is like he didn't want to just make an empty film that doesn't have. He, George was not an empty calorie filmmaker. He was not the type of guy to go out and just do something, eh, blow some shit up, have some zombies rip some people apart, and that's enough. No, no, there had to be something else going on. So whether the film, any given film, is fully successful or not, there's meat on the bone there. 
to discuss and to chew on and go, hey, there's something really interesting here. And Bruiser, Bruiser has aged very well with me over the years. And it's one that I, uh, like I said, I would love to revisit it with a special edition, get a new 4K out there of it. So the um, fact that you're talking about that, Michael, means it'll probably be out in about the next six months. Well, no, no. Six to eight months. The fact that I'm talking be about it means it probably won't happen. That's true. That's actually true. Yeah. No, I wouldn't be freely talking about it if it were actually happening because then I have to keep it on the down low. Uh, so right. I can you're honestly say there's shot. nothing. Right. There's but no, trick or treat's yeah. totally happening, though, right? See? It fucking is because you'd be no, talking about not, it. No, <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah. No, I would love well, to trick or treat, but there are there are some factors holding that up for foreseeable future. So, yeah. uh, well, how come it didn't hold up all these fucking t-shirts? I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about that now. This is not what we're supposed to be talking about. No, no we're not with it. So, CK, you're not you're not a hater anymore. At least you're not completely bashing I mean, honestly, this movie like, anymore. It was one of it was one of those movies that I tried to watch it. 20 years ago or whatever it was when it was on IFC channel. And uh, it's just bizarre. It is very odd. Um, and it still is, you know, and there's aspects of the movie that I still, I'm not a huge fan of. I don't like the music in it. Like that's one of the big things that it's like a art, yeah. like art house style music. So I actually like the music very much. I love it. I yeah. It's Donald, Donald Rubenstein. Rubenstein. Yeah, yeah. It's just their third movie together. Yeah. Like another yeah, I mean, Martin I'm, comparison. Yeah, normally, you know, Donald Rubenstein stuff, stuff, but yeah, that that I just didn't feel it. And uh, I, I agree with you, CK, though, on like the uh, like the house music, you know, like the party music, some of the selections that they mu- they used for just like the source background. music. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that wasn't yeah. the best. It was very stock. Yeah, the song uh, yeah. at the very end of the movie too. I'm like, what the fuck? What? Mm. what? The, yeah. That take, take on take me. On me. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah that was odd. Horrible. That was a little bit like, <laughs> yeah, doesn't fit at all. I tell you, the only problem I really had after watching it again, what? And this is bizarre, but it's Tom Atkins because that role that he, I could not help but compare him in that role to like Night of the Creeps. Now I know that you're like well, not supposed to do coat. that. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's but... like, yeah. I, I always thought, as I always wanted to ask her, is, is this the same guy from Two Evil Eyes <laughs> that he just yeah. wandered up into Toronto? Because it's like he's almost the same guy. <laughs> he you know, was a detective I mean, in uh, Maniac Cop as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he has. He's worn that yeah. trench coat about yeah. five times. Yeah, and doing, but he's played thing. cops so many times. You know, and you, you know, I, I just because of that, like I just flash back to that mood. I'm like. I compare his performance in Bruiser to his performance in Night of the Creeps. And I know that's not like a just thing to do or anything. I just can't no. help it. Like it's No, just... I mean, yeah, obviously he cuts an, a, a memorable impression in that yeah. role. So it's like, yeah. But yeah, he just, he, and, and but you know what? Interesting that the, the Tom Atkins character is probably the most relatable character in the movie because yeah. he spends most of his time going, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, that's on? exactly what he does throughout the whole <laughs> movie. Yeah. It's like, what the hell is it? What? What happened? What the fuck happened here? He's like, I love it whenever he, he'll walk into a scene and go, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> what, what the shit? You know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, that movie was a, when looking back now at George's career and his life over, that was a, that was a very important film for him in a lot of ways. Cause obviously it was the first film he made in Canada. He'd worked in Canada prior to that. He did the scoring sessions for monkey shines up there with the composer in Toronto. So he had known of Toronto before, but at that time that Bruiser came together, the there was just that there was that big rush to do a lot of films in Toronto or in Canada because of the the exchange, the money exchange was so beneficial to us. And Pittsburgh, he couldn't get anything going in Pittsburgh; it was too expensive, and, and most of the people he knew and worked with were gone at that point. And he went up to Toronto and he, he found his new family up there, and everything transitioned up to to you know he did the Land of the Dead up there and. Let me ask you this, though. You know, I I mean, I hate to say this, but it's true. Land of the Dead would have never happened if it wasn't for that Dawn of the Dead remake. Oh, George said that. That's why. Yeah. And how do you think his career would have went if the zombie genre didn't have that little comeback there? What what do you Mm -hmm. think he would have done or would could have Bruiser maybe been his last movie? Oh, I don't think it would have been his last movie, but I think... 
I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, if the zombie thing hadn't taken... Well, here's the weird thing. If the zombie genre hadn't taken off, I think he still would have been able to get zombie movies on his scale done because he had his own little niche. And that had been the case. So, you know, someone... If that if if zombie movies didn't become a big thing, uh, he could still find four or five million dollars to do one because it's a George Romero zombie. That's a that's its own specific candy bar. That's you know if you love that candy bar, you're not going to buy. If you're a Butterfinger guy, you're not going to go buy a fucking Fifth Avenue. You're sticking with a Butterfinger. So he would always be able to get financing to do that specific thing. But because zombies blew up in the culture because of movies, especially because of video games. Um, that it created that, like I said, that schism where it had to be $50 million. And after Land of the Dead, he said, I don't even want to do anything that big again, you know, because it's just too much other people have a say in shit and too much pressure. And all, at the end, it's just like, yeah. why are we spending all this money to do this thing? I know we could do it a different way, you know? And so he didn't even want to do that again. You know, Land of the Dead was a very exhausting project for him. Uh, for a lot of reasons, and and that's why the last two were scaled in a certain way. Because he was like, I just don't, we don't need, I don't want all that, you know. Uh, and it, it's so, but eventually he couldn't even get that for a zombie movie because it was either spend thirty million or spend three dollars, you know. And he wasn't going to do a three dollars. He just wasn't going to do that. If you go back and look at Land of the Dead now, I think the budget was roughly twenty five million. I don't think it was even that high. I think yeah, it was maybe like less. seventeen, twenty. It was in that oh. range. It wasn't as much as the Dawn remake was. It looks like a two hundred million dollar movie when you it look does. at it. It does. It's huge. It's, it's, it's huge. The scale, the the look, the feel, it's massive. It's a blockbuster style yeah. movie. I mean, he really stretched that dollar. He did. He got a lot of a lot of bang for the buck in that picture. And uh even with the smaller ones he did after that, like Survival of the Dead. Survival, yeah. Was way more ambitious than that budget allotted for. I mean, considering what we were dealing with up there, that movie was almost entirely exterior. There were a few interior sets here and there and then the inside of the Brinks truck. But it was all, we shot outdoors for 90% of it, which adds great production value. But we were boned by the weather from the moment we started that movie. And so that should have had, an, you know, we should have had a lot more money just to, you know, just in case of rain days or snow days or ice days or whatever the hell else we dealt with. But George had always a very big, he, he, he thought big. And I think it was hard for him on some level to kind of go, oh, I got to scale down to some, oh, okay. But if he knew that's what the deal was, he figured out a way to make that work. But his, he, he was always pushing it, always pushing it to the very edge in terms of what can I get? What can I get out of myself and the people I work with? You know, he wasn't an easy filmmaker to work for in terms of, yeah, you know, we're just going to shoot a bunch of conversations in a, in a, on a two wall set in a studio somewhere. No, no, you're going to be outside in Toronto in October, freezing your ass off, you know, tearing a guy <laughs> apart on a farm. <laughs> you know, it's going to. But the results is you get a film that looks. I mean, Creepshow for me, I, the Creepshow, when I look back at Creepshow, that's for me one of the most technically proficient films I've ever seen. And just in terms of the variety of the photography and the sets and the, the performances, I mean, that is such a, a well-crafted movie. Mm -hmm. And yet it was made for peanuts compared to what another film, if, if a studio tried to do a movie like that, it would be five times, six times the budget what George had to work with back then and that probably wouldn't be half as effective as what George did because he was just like no he found the people to work with he understood what he had to do and he just relied on very talented people working at the top of their craft and that you know well I could go on forever ultimately <laughs> I'm curious like the big question for me is of these two movies which one do you prefer which one Bruiser Dark Bruiser. Half or Bruiser Oh, I'd probably go to Bruiser more often yeah. because I'm still not 100% comfortable with it to some degree. I've seen Dark Half more, but I Bruiser is the one that I think challenges me more than Dark Half does. Um, yeah, Bruiser is in my top five or six Romero films. I love it. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's You're a grower. Bruiser I mean, maniac, brother. Like I said, I mean, I would say I would be the number one fan of it if it wasn't for my co-host. He's a freak. 
Yeah, Matt is a freak about Bruiser. Uh, that's the, that's he like he owns the, the director's chair from Bruiser. I mean, yeah. Jesus, he's done yeah. location finding on Bruiser. I mean, if and when a, a DVD or Blu-ray ever that ever happens, mm. if I don't get Matt involved, he'll hunt me down and beat the <laughs> shit out of me. I, I almost feel guilty like talking about it without him here. You know, but, I uh, somehow expected him to beam himself I, into the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I heard Bruiser was being discussed. <laughs> it's just like there, it's like he breaks in. But Robot I, yeah. House was mentioning though uh, that we didn't talk about the Misfits were in it towards the uh, end of the. Oh yeah, I yeah. think they did a couple <laughs> right. of songs, and they did yeah. a video. And he did a video for one of the for the yeah. For the Romero Misfits. directed yeah. one of their videos. Yeah. So uh, Tina Romero is one of the uh, young ladies dancing on one and of the podiums. Andrew there. Romero is the little kid on the top going die. die. That's you know, <laughs> with the little CGI yeah, the little, uh, yeah. Wand. The yeah. wand. Yeah, yeah, that's him. And also, there's a couple of folks from the uh, Iron City Ass Kickers in that scene. It's JB. You can find them in the yeah, it, yeah. George. It is, yeah, it's funny. There's always so, little people in the background. JB there. Destiny and Big Papa. They the guys that are slamming each other against the poles. Right, and stuff. right, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's an interesting movie, and it's one that I've gone back to more often, a lot more in the last few years, actually. Especially when after George passed away, I went back and watched it again. I was just like. Yeah, this is this one dares you to love it in a weird way. It's almost like <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely it's, the more independent of the two. I mean, the dark. Oh, hat. sure, yeah. I feel George's voice all over Bruiser. I mean, that's you know, yeah. throughout. Whereas that's with Dark Half, like I said, it's a little bit more pulled back and more of a conventional uh, narrative. And you know, it's, I it's think the dark half, though, man, like it, it had it been tweaked a little bit, it could have been like. A huge success. I really feel I, that. I, what hurts Dark Half and changes. George would have, would have been the first to admit it was the conclusion. They didn't have the effects to finish it off properly. Oh. And he had big issues with... There was a big argument with the studio about the direction that the birds were flying into the horizon. It's like, <laughs> it's like was it, why are the birds flying up? Are they they're taking him to heaven? It's like, no, they're, they're going into the afterlife. But it looks like they're taking him to heaven. And George... They're taking just him to the holographic face, like, cloud. Like, no... <laughs> And so they, and since, you know, at some point, Orion just started cutting costs wherever they could. They just had to finish up pretty much with what they had. And those, and he's, every time we would, when we would watch that movie, he would look at those digital birds and go, ah. <laughs> no, it was just like, and it, it hurts the movie. Because also, the movie just kind of ends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. just like, George Stark is torn apart, da 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 da, boom, birds disappear, and then the credits roll, and you're like, oh, oh okay. You know, and it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. And that's Isn't it's it interesting. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, because I think the most effective part of that movie are the birds up to the end. Like right. the way that the yeah. other, the other scenes were shot, like where he goes into the trance and all that. And, and oh, there's the, great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the opening scene with the hospital yeah. and all the birds flying around. And I love Christopher Young's score for that yeah. movie. It's yeah. really a theory. And, but even Christopher Young was just like, I got kind of boned on that too. I didn't even get to really finish the score and I felt so bad for George because I had to kind of stop at some point and he had to kind of just work with what he had. And uh, it was just, it, it was unfortunate. It was just really unfortunate that they didn't get to do a, a pop, a final pass on that. And as an editor on my own work, I know that if I don't get to do that final pass, I always feel like, oh God, I didn't really get to, I didn't finesse it just right. I didn't get to do exactly what I was supposed to do on that. And I think that's, I think that's how George felt on Dark Half. It's like, it almost felt unfinished in some regards, I think he felt. I want to say that, that uh, like, review audiences got to look at, like, an unfinished kind of work print. And, then and they, they didn't were, know what was going on. Yeah, yeah, and especially in that last scene, the effects weren't finished. and Because yeah, the birds weren't even there. So they so were like, well, what am I looking at? Yeah, and so they're making commentary or turning in comment cards on that final scene, and they're, Orion's making changes based on that. Yeah. And I think you hear a lot, George Romero talked a lot about, you know, the Orange County theater goers, you know, controlling his destiny. Yeah. And I think that maybe that's the source of God. it there. And that happened uh, on Monkey Shines, too, where it was yeah. just like they misread the notes on that because they didn't, the original conclusion, which is actually on the, uh, the Blu ray, thank God, Pat Booba. May you rest in peace. He actually saved a VHS that had the original ending on, and he gave it to me when I was working on that. Had 
you know, this ending where the doctor goes in to get the serum and he just realizes he's going to use it for nefarious purposes. And they thought, well, George, they did a screening of it and the, the studio came back to the notes. So people don't like the ending. It's like, okay, well, what did they not like about it? Well, they just, just didn't like it. They, they misread the notes. What they didn't like was the fact that he walked again at the end of the picture. They said that was bullshit. It was just like, come on. Really? I mean, it, 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 it's like he's crippled this whole time and then magically at the end, he, they were responding actually to that. But they left that in the movie, but they made him change the ending so that they, you know, it was just, it was, and, and again, he lost Pet Cemetery as a result of that. Ah. Because he was going to go into Pet Cemetery, he was going to go into pre production on Pet Cemetery, but he couldn't do that. So he had to, he had to walk away from that. And so it's just, and the what's weird is if you've seen the original ending to, to Monkey Shines, I, I don't think it works very well because it's a weird kind of like, moment where Steven Root playing the, the, the head of the university or whatever holds up the serum and he just kind of like poses like this yeah. and it gets dark <laughs> and it's just kind of like oh, shit. it's an odd note to end the movie on especially with a side character that we haven't really spent much time with so I think if they if people had been more observant and actually maybe talked about it more they could have actually found a, and, and as the end and I will say this it's a great shock when the in the dream sequence when the monkey pops up out of the back but it's one of those shocks that George pointed this out. It's like you go, ah, oh, 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 oh. Well, that was dumb. You know, <laughs> you have the, you have that reaction that immediately followed by it. Well, come on, you know. And uh, again, George, I can just hear George going, ah, come on, you know. So he was not happy about having to do that. And again, we it, need to do we need to do a whole show on Monkey Shines. I would like one of these forgotten remember ones on Season of the Witch and Monkey Shines. Now I'm not saying like. Yeah, maybe in that order or anything, but I mean, I love I would, Monkey I, Shines. I, I yeah. think Monkey Shines is a hoot. Uh, that movie is so much fun. There's a lot it. of his movies that I think a lot of people haven't. Martin is another one, man, because that one has been out of print for how long? Well, it's, it's been off the market for ten years yeah. now, plus. Very expensive like if you want to yeah. track it down. That yeah. Landscape, Second Sight uh, restorations coming soon, so. When was that Lionsgate DVD? Oh four. Oh god. Oh four. Still got it there, it's been yeah. fifteen years, I think, since that's been in print. The Anchor yeah. Bay yeah. DVD is still going for crazy was, money too. It's yeah, ninety ninety eight, I want to say, or ninety nine on that one. Yeah, yeah. The first yeah, time I, I ever heard of yeah. Martin was there was a documentary that just I think all they talked about for Romero's part was Martin in mm -hmm. it. Um American Nightmare or something like that. Yeah, maybe? American mm -hmm. Nightmare, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Martin's brilliant. Ma Martin is one of his best movies. It's just that movie yes. is absolutely amazing. It is so. What I love about Martin the most is that the feel of it. You, you, Braddock, the town where they filmed it, is a character in that movie. The yeah. the decay of that town, which was you know it was one of the many towns in Pennsylvania that was decimated when the steel industry just upped and left, and it's still like that sadly. Uh, but you just can feel everything crumbling around him as he's walking the streets and everything's just falling apart and dying. And it just yeah. adds this weird decay, feeling of decay to the whole proceedings. And I, I love that movie, I think. And I can't wait to see eventually someday a longer version of it to see what, what was that going to be like. Um, Are you involved in the second site at all? No, well, um, I did. I did do. I shot interviews with Sarah Venable, the, one of the actresses. Oh, that's and awesome. Donald, and Donald Rubenstein. Um, I did. Uh, I shot them, and I did the. I think I did the edit on the Rubenstein piece. It's hard for me to remember at this point, um, but there will be a couple things I did on that. So amazing. Uh, Wes yeah. Ray is asking: Were there any other Stephen King movies that George was attached to? Oh God! To direct. I bet. Yeah, about I bet there ten were, of them. The, I think. The last stand. <laughs> Yeah, Stan, he was even approached about Salem's Lot at one point. I mm -hmm. think he was even talking about it maybe in the early days. It's Girl of Love, Tom uh, Gordon. Tom he Gordon. actually optioned yeah. that property and yeah. um, that one. Was that the um, Sharon Stone one? Or was, was or no, she was the Before I Wake, right? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, okay. that was Before I Wake. Um, you know, the Girl of Love, Tom Gordon. Uh, there was, oh God, I think there was so many different ones. Well, Pet Cemetery, obviously, mm -hmm. was one. He was attached to pretty much everything Stephen King wrote at one point or another, I think, because they just became so synonymous with each other after Creepshow, and everyone wanted to see them collaborate again. But uh, no, yeah, they're, they're, there's way more projects they didn't get to make together than they actually ended up doing together. 
when I got that laser disc signed, I was like, you ever going to work with George again? And he's like, I don't know, man, he's gotten pretty weird. (laughs) (laughs) That was, that was was right when he had moved to Canada and gotten super political. But they did work together again because I, they, they did, he did a voice in Diary of the Dead. That's right. Uh, Stephen King uh, get on your preacher. fucking knees. Yeah, he's the preacher on the radio. <laughs> get on your knee. Get on your fucking knee. And that was that was improv. On the on the DVD, I have the original recording session that they did over the phone with him, and he improv that. That's and awesome. George was cracking up. He was just like, "Oh man, that was great. No, that's it. We got it. That was great." It was meant. And so yeah, yeah, they still they didn't see each other that much in the in their later years but uh they still had a great deal of aff- it's, george had an enormous amount of affection for stephen king he always still felt that stephen king blamed him for his performance in creep show though because <laughs> he, he wanted to say you had you know he wanted george you know say like, think roadrunner think wiley e. coyote which works beautifully in that movie it does by the way. yeah um but you know he stephen king got a ration of shit from the critics but he would have gotten a ration of shit from the critics no matter what performance he gave. They were lying in wait for him at that point. So, oh, he thinks he can act too, does he? You know. So, but I, I think it totally. I think it totally eight. works for what it is. Oh, it's. Br- oh, I, I think perfect. his performance in that yeah. is f- perfect. Yeah, it's absolutely well, it's, perfect. Subtlety was, was not kid, called for with Judd and Jordy Verrill. That was my you know, favorite. that kind of look. B A D. Still quoting. <laughs> you know, Jordy Verrill has become my favorite of the five stories over the years. Because it's the most atypical, it's not the typical revenge EC kind of comeuppance story. The guy, the, 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 Jordy Verrill's fault, his, his crime is his ignorance. That's what's his, you know, he doesn't screw anybody over. He doesn't have, you know, huge, you know, dreams of avarice in terms of riches. He just wants to pay off his fucking bank loan with, <laughs> yeah. you know, he's, you know, he's a watch very, wrestling. Yeah, yeah, watch wrestling. Yeah. Department of has, Meteors. Yeah, and I, and I and that was another thing when uh, Bingo O'Malley in that. I didn't realize yeah. he also played Jordy's father in that. I knew it was the same guy playing the the the, the you know university <laughs> professor and the doctor. But it was like later, I was like, no, oh, that was him too. Shit, uh, you're not gonna get in that water, are you, Jordy? <laughs> <laughs> Jordy? The angled scene where he's rolling in the uh, oh yeah, chair. just rolls through <laughs> the yeah. chair. Yeah, it was, it was Stephen King. Oh. <laughs> you know, and but I love, but King has some wonderful moments of pathos in that. Where he's like, I'm growing, you know. He's just like you feel sorry for the guy, and I think he's a, he's a he gave a wonderful performance in that. But again, that's another thing I could go on for fucking hours and hours and hours about. Vince yeah. McMahon cameo, I think on the uh, yeah the yeah he's he's the commentator on that yeah mm-hmm. yeah, yeah but it's it, it's I I I think that uh, yeah in terms of Stephen King stuff he was a, a, I think from a Buick Eight yeah I think that's yeah, true I think he was attached to that one. too. Again, the the list of of titles of Stephen King potential projects is is limitless practically. I think Mick Garris came along and took every goddamn <laughs> one of them. I swear to God, Mick Garris has done like ten Stephen King adaptations. Yeah, he's done. He's done I think he's got the record for the most. That's for sure. Yeah, I remember the Salem's Lot. They were like, uh, it's right coming on the heels of Martin. It was like mm-hmm. Vampire Small Town. Vampire, vampire, vampire Small, small vampires Town. Small yeah. Town. yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's how that. they met. That's how he met Stephen King for the first time. Was through that. So Warner Brothers put them together to meet, and they very quickly said, "Now Salem's not really for me, but the Stand. I wouldn't want to do the Stand." And then that led to Creepshow eventually, and then but the Stand never happened. Are you but, surprised uh, that uh, we haven't seen a remake of the Dark Half? Well, they Spoiler. announced one a while ago. Mm-hmm. There was going to be one, but I don't know what's going on with it. Um, someone, oh, really? yeah, they. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens at some point. Why? I mean, shit. Why not? They remake everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but uh, it would be interesting to see what another version of that because it actually it's very faithful to the book. So I, you know, it'd be interesting to see what direction they might take. I always thought the dark half would work well as a TV show. You know, mm-hmm. where, you know, he and George Stark battling it out over years. You know, this whole almost like a fugitive thing. You know, that would be kind of interesting. But you know, I have weird ideas. So hmm. <laughs> I tell you, another one we need to do is Night Riders. Because I know oh, that yeah. the, I'd say that's probably his least known or one of his least known. I would I, Bruiser. Films. I think of of his major works is the one that's probably the Bruiser least and Vanilla. Still. Yeah. Vanilla. Oh I, Vanilla. shit! I even I forgot about that. Yeah. But you know what, Vanilla. I am I am the number one Vanilla fan, so don't do a show on that without bringing me. <laughs> you know what? I probably be number two. I I really like that. I love movie. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say it's overall a successful film. 
But what I love about it is that it captures a time and place yes. so, that's so specific and didn't exist for more than maybe nine or ten months. Mm-hmm. In this weird no- this area where the seventy, the sixties were ending, the seventies were beginning, and women's rights and the, the argument over abortion was beginning. There was this little period there where everything was sort of in transition, and that's when they filmed this movie. And it represents that transition very, very well. Also, the performances, especially by Ray Lane, are very Thank strong you. in that movie. Yeah, it's a Ray Lane showcase. Yeah, I'm, he is I'm a, really, really good. I think I'm yeah. the world's only Ray Lane Mark. And, <laughs> uh, he, uh, yeah, his he performance. was the husband in Season of the Witch, and I almost, yeah. I never reckon, I almost didn't recognize him because he was playing such a different guy in that. Uh, he was one of those guys I wish I had gotten to meet. He died way too young. Yeah, I would have loved to have met him. He was one of those guys that was all. He was in the Romero sort of orbit he would come in and out but he was very well respected by so many of the acting he was an acting teacher and um i always wonder what he would have been like as roger and he would have been good he would have been very good yeah uh he could have done anything he was an exceptionally good actor and i think in the end there's always a vanilla was really a showcase for him Mm -hmm. but again it's just the music and the and the the way and the photography around pittsburgh it's like it captured a pittsburgh that didn't exist in time for more than maybe a year before things really began to shift. And it's it's a remarkable encapsulation of a moment in time. It really is. And and more, most importantly, in, in Pittsburgh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, because if it had been in New Jersey, I don't think I would have cared. No. Uh. <laughs> no, no, no. And Pittsburgh is a character in that movie much the way that yeah. Braddock is a character in Martin. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it, it's just, he captured something with that. Um, so if it's and there's also totally, the... Yeah. The right what you know element. They were, you know, they were still embroiled in the uh, mm-hmm. commercial industry, and yeah. you know, they were just kind of yeah, because they were also coming. Yeah, because the, the the character, you know, the, the movie deals with the advertising industry. Yeah. And so and then George was well and so well ensconced in that, and was already kind of disillusioned with a lot of the people he had to deal with at that time, and so that's a commentary on that. I mean, it was it was a it was a troubled production in a lot of ways, very very much so, but. Uh, what remains is, I think, very interesting. And George watched it. He and I watched it together. <sighs> uh, he hadn't watched it all the way through since he made it. No and shit. He, yeah, he had not wow. watched it. And we watched it, and I'll never forget, we were sitting there watching it, and at one point, he was tearing up. And I'm like, and I didn't ask him why, but I think he was maybe tearing up because he's seeing this moment in his life that existed his period, his creative life and the friends and the people that he worked with, they're there. It was like traveling back in time for him in a way. But I never asked him why he did. Because I didn't want to I didn't want to intrude on that for some reason. I just was like, no, I'll just kind of observe this. But it was and at the end he was just like, you know what? That's not bad. You know, was for all the crap for, we went through on that movie. The Anchor Bay D V D, right? Was that around that time frame? Was it Anchor Bay or <laughs> Uh, we did that in 2000 or, oh no, I know it was 2004. It was, it was in 2004, 2005 when that, cause it was a, there's always vanilla was a bonus on the season of the witch. DVD. Oh, Jesus. Right. Yeah. And it was a shitty, I mean, we had a, we didn't have access to any elements at the time. We just had the old one inch master that had been kicking around for probably. So yeah, I mean, years. I was going to ask like, how would you watch it before? I mean, was there a VHS there release was, of an underground boot. Well, it wasn't a bootleg one. I think something weird video had it out. They had it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because he had Mike Vraney, who ran it back then, he had access to an element for There's Always Vanilla. He probably didn't put that out until the mid 90s at the earliest, yeah, though. Yeah. So it was just, it was one of those films that was talked about. And I don't think it any, had an official VHS release or never anything. Never did. Like, never yeah. did that I'm aware of. Not even under the title of The Affair. Now, uh, I don't mean to spoil anything but this viewing that you had with with george and i yeah. believe suze was that this is kind of recent year right yeah it was yeah. a couple of years before he passed away yeah and these are documented from what i understand yeah i, I haven't talked much about this because we don't know what we're going to do with this material but something happened uh um what's this? i kind of trying to remember what year this was i think it was 2015 maybe 2016 uh george decided he wanted to do something. He wasn't sure if it was going to be like a um, an audio thing or a, a book thing, but he wanted to start and watch and comment and talk about his entire career from beginning to end. Oh, and Jesus. he brought me up 
to record and do the conversations with him. We were going to watch every single film he did in chronological <laughs> order. And we did it over, I think, two or three sessions up there. And we watched Wait. every single, every single movie. You actually did this? Yes. Yeah. And there's footage of this that it, I'll fucking kill you, fellas. If this doesn't come out, <laughs> if this doesn't come out for some bullshit reason, I'll strangle you today. There's, there's audio. I'll drive recording. to Michigan it's, it's where your like ass a is. Podcast. It, 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 yeah, like a you know, I thought, oh, okay. I, I thought about that. I thought about it's that. It's just audio only, right? It's audio only, yeah. but we talked I'll about every every single thing that he ever did, and we I, watched, we were like we'd watch Night of the Living Dead and then spend an hour talking about it. How watched, is this not out? Me and me we and didn't Matt. Know. Um, <laughs> Me and Matt did an interview with Suze before we even came on board, and she basically described that to it. I had to like walk out of the room and like collect myself for a minute. I'm like, this happened. It, <laughs> well, like... it was. It, I'll tell you, it was looking. Yeah. Looking back at it, I'm so grateful for that experience because it was just I got to see him literally reliving his life in a way through these things because these things are you know for a filmmaker all these movies are markers in time for who you were when you made them and the people you worked with and knew at that time and that was so true for because he had his filmmaking family at so many different points in his life not I mean, different iterations of it in pittsburgh and all the way through into uh into canada and some of our discussions went into other areas that weren't really related to the movie, but were more related to, Hey, what was going on with you at the time? You know, that sort of thing. Cause I, I'd known George for a long time at that point, And I guess he just felt comfortable talking with me about this stuff. And it was great. I don't know how many hours it is. I mean, it's gotta be at least 20, 30 hours worth of stuff. I mean, I mean, just, it would just have to be just based on the amount of stuff. We listen, talk. like, I well, I mean, I, honestly, even if like, you listen, if you never release the or nothing ever happens with it, you just send it to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I promise that nothing will happen with it. Just no, it's it. actually something that's been on my mind a lot lately. <laughs> the, the 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 um, we weren't sure when we recorded it what we were going to do with it. Even then, we just wanted to get his thought, and we didn't want it to be an on-camera thing because you know the camera. If there's a camera on you changes the dynamic of things to some degree yeah so we just you know i put a recorder down between us and we just talk and you forget the recorders over there um i, I you know we and so when but then he passed away in 2017 and we really hadn't figured out yet what we we're going to do with it um it's been something actually lately on my mind i think i have an idea on what to do and what how to present the material and I'm going to take that to Susan, talk to her about it, because I really would like to get it out there. Because it's, it's, it was such Priceless. a special thing to be able to, and I was so honored that he asked me to do it. I was just like, you know, and, and they almost, I remember Susie and, and, and even talking to me, and George was like, hey, is this something you think you could find time for? I'm like, find time <laughs> for? <laughs> I, I would pair, shoot buddy. everybody on my street twice in the head <laughs> if I could do I mean, you can't. Find time for if I had the greatest job in the world, if I was president of the United States, I quit to go fucking do this. I mean, this, the, 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 this was, uh, are you, yeah, yes, I'll, yes, <laughs> you know, just come like, come on. Um, yeah, and there were some really wonderful discussions. Like, I would, like, we you, really went into that period of, uh, of studio development that went nowhere and stuff like that. And again, we, we did it in chronological order all the way wow. through. Uh, survival it's amazing and it was now, um, let me yeah. ask you let me ask you this Felcher. has anybody heard this i'm sure well Suze was there for a lot of it i mean she was okay. and she's on some of the uh the tracks actually um so she was there for pretty much all of it i think sometimes she'd sit in on the movies and sometimes she wouldn't be there i, I think some of them weren't wasn't it her first time seeing some of those yeah a, a couple of them or it was the first time in a long time really ever really sitting down and watching them. but like I mean, for example on there's always real you know, that was the first time yeah. it's like mike i've never i this was such an unpleasant experience i just literally we finished the movie and i just went like, bye that was just like we're not even gonna and he was loath to ever really talk about it, but after watching it again, it's like, you know, that wasn't half bad. And then yet he remembered Season of the Witch being better, and then he watched it and was like, I didn't like that as much as I thought I remembered Season of the Witch. And so that's why I wanted to remake it, because it's like, I, this, I never felt like we really got it. Um, it was just, 
yeah. I mean, so I don't know. Do you think like he maybe approached you because I don't know how private he was about, you know, he was sick there, uh, for a little bit. Oh. Was that, did he, he, maybe he was nothing thinking, was ever just, I never, that was never discussed, uh, anything like that. So, I mean, was, yeah, nobody knows, right. If that was maybe, and I don't know if I, I certainly don't think he, anything was known at that time that oh, okay. he was, no, I mean, and, and again, that was not something that was ever discussed with me. And I wouldn't want to speculate on what was going on. Cause that's, again, it was really, that was none of my concern. That's just unusual. You know what I'm saying? I mean, usually well, I you think, would, I, you know, I don't know. And I'd have to ask Suze again as to what motivated him to decide to do that. Or if it was Suze's idea, it might've been Suze's idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's been, I mean, again, I didn't ask a lot of questions because it was just like, right. you want me to do what? Yeah. When? Bye. <laughs> Click. And it's just like, I'm in the car heading up there. And it's just like, I'll, I didn't, I didn't need uh, a lot of, uh, <laughs> I didn't need a lot of details. Yeah. George wants me to do what? Hit myself in the head with a hammer 15 times? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, again, this, this was, I, I was not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. And for as far as I was concerned, I was just like, I was just so damn happy to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, in terms of what, you know, that's something that I, and after George passed away, I just felt I, it was too hard to even think about what to do with any of that. Cause it was just like, Oh God. But now it's been it's been five years. Hard to believe. God, it's been five plus years now since he passed away. No kidding. And I think it's time for me to really finally just go. Well, here's look. It's not about making money with it or whatever. I don't care a shit about that. But I I, I just it, it should be out there in some form. So I, I'm going to talk to Suze about it because I do have an idea that I think would work very very well and it would present the material as it is. You know, not try to transform it into something else. You'd actually hear George's voice and hear me talking with him and be a fly on the wall for these, these really great conversations that we had, which, you know, shit. <laughs> it, was just, yeah. it was really something else. It's the yeah. most I think I've ever talked about this. No it, one... It's unreal that that exists. I mean, that, and it's Yeah, that's amazing. what I was thinking. Yeah, that's a, it's a, the same thing. And you did. Well, if, wanted... if you really want me to piss you off, I'm looking at the folder of it right now yeah. on my hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> it's, it's all right there. Oh, uh, get it backed up. Oh, I've had I, I, I backed <laughs> up. It's Please like back it up. Quadruple backed up. There's, Actually, there's... if you want to, you can email it to me. I'll be a third source. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Suze has a copy. I think Peter Grunwald has a copy of it too. Actually, uh, so there and and I have two backups of it here. So it's it's not Good. going anywhere. You know. So, cool. But yeah, awesome. it that. And yeah, but we we talk about every every single thing we went through, every, and even two evil eyes. I think we even talk about tales from the dark side a little bit, although he wasn't that involved with uh, the series really or the movie aside from just writing. How, the how many days did this take? God, it's hard. For, it was I I want to say it was at least two different sessions I went up there, and it was a matter of probably collectively six or seven days, maybe. Damn. Maybe I'm not sure. I would have to go back and look because I know I went up there on two separate trips at least. Maybe there was a third trip. I don't know, but I think it was at least two trips. Um, and it was yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it, we, again because you had to watch. We would watch the movie in its entirety. And a lot of George's <laughs> movies are long. Um, and then we would sit there and talk about it until whenever time we didn't feel like talking about it anymore. And. Uh, I swear to God, though, like, the one thing that I would not want to see happen with it is it get into the hands of one of these companies that'll cut the shit out of it and no, put it into no. these, like, sound bites in this fucking, like, you know, documentary. No, I and that and that's something that was, because, again, with it being audio, it's just like, well, we could do a book with it. But, if it, yeah, but then you you lose the hearing him. Mm -hmm. You lose the yeah. the back and forth. And, and so... And again, yeah, if it's just kind of chopped up into little sound bites, I don't think there's any value in that either. You I mean, there's anything to be it done as an because audio book. Yeah, but it's not really in the form of a book either. It's like it's I don't know, it's a weird it's a weird situation where Audio diary, George. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. Just, I don't know. It's I don't give a shit how he releases it. I just want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I don't give a shit. Exactly. I no, really? and I and I think it, I think you know what, it, it's funny now that we've had this conversation, I'm definitely going to uh talk to Sue because I did have an idea a couple of months ago going you know what if we did it like this I could present it largely uncut and you cut 
every now and then, you know, we'd bump the mic or take a break or something. I mean, you'd cut that shit out. But it would, uh, it would largely be exactly as we did it. And just go for it, you know, and just see how people react to it. Because cool. I think it's, it's, you know... It was it was an amazing thing. It it's kind of it's kind of um, historical in a way. Like it's like yeah. archiving. You it know. is. I mean, it's it's yeah. literally a filmmaker talking about his entire creative life. Yeah. yeah, and that's and it's and it's George. You know, I mean, Christ, I, who well, doesn't want? Maybe that gets out there, and maybe maybe Carpenter says, "Hey, let's do it too." You know. I mean, oh God, I have to sit with him for. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, "Shut up." Look, let me talk. You know what? John Carpenter does not like talking about his own work at all. Yeah. No, he doesn't like talking yeah. about anything except. You know, but if I want to talk to him about if I want to talk to him about the Xbox, Last of Us, the video game, he would probably talk <laughs> yeah. eight hours on that. Turtle Creek headphones. He likes talking about that. Yeah, or basketball or something, or <laughs> wrestling or something. But George and and George was interesting. He didn't. He was reluctant to talk about some of his work too. I don't think it was easy for him at first, but. He, he got in. He really got into it. I mean, Night of the Living Dead was sort of our warm up in a way, and George has talked about Night so much that he could just rely on you know, all the stories he's obviously told. But I really wanted to concentrate on like just the impact of what that you know. Looking back, the how can you judge the impact that had on your life and career? You know, who knew? How could you possibly have known at the time what that was going to do for you? And yeah. it was just it was interesting. It was just I mean, God. See, it was, you know, the, I remember Don May talking about you know that all this different stuff exists from from Halloween that has oh, never yeah. been really and I always thought okay that would be the like the dream project that I would want to see come out but no this is the fucking dream project <laughs> Mike. so if you don't do something with this fucking shit I'm gonna kill your ass uh, I want you to know that no I promise I'm I'm I, I, I now that now that we've had this discussion I am going to talk to I have to talk to Suze about it anyway some other stuff anyway but uh, I'll bring it up and, and propose to what we're gonna do and maybe it'll be something that benefits the foundation you know. We'll yeah, I was going to that. mention you uh, throughout the month of October, they're doing a fundraiser as well. I was mm-hmm. going to let you guys talk about that. Yeah, if well, you guys that, can get yeah, over yeah. to George A. Romero Foundation dot org. And we're trying to raise 20 grand by the end of October, which is just a few days away now. But if you go over there, you can uh, find the donate link at George A. Romero dot com or dot or George A. Romero Foundation dot org. We also if you don't. You know, if you're not feeling the donation, we've got all sorts of 40th anniversary creep show gear, amusement park gear, all sorts, all sorts of stuff in the uh, store. So, Get a yeah. Night Riders mug. The Night Riders mugs are really yeah. cool. Lots of Night Riders 40th They're gear really, too, really from cool. last year. Yeah. There's yeah. a new uh, vinyl soundtrack coming out for Night Riders, I believe, shortly mm-hmm. as well. Heard about heard. that. Yeah. That's actually we we were involved in that. Um, so yeah, that should be really kind of the. The, you know, if you're into the Knight Rider soundtrack, this should be the definitive edition. Mm-hmm. So, and it's going to be limited. So, definitely pounce on that once it, uh, once. It, and actually, I, you may be more up to date than me, CK. <laughs> what did what did you hear? I, I knew we were working on it, but I didn't realize an announcement had gone out. I don't think I don't know if it's officially came out. I got some. Um, <laughs> he got a scoop. <laughs> I don't. I think well, I know it, it's who's coming out, but I don't know if they've announced it. Yet it's not, coming so and it, it, it'll be on i believe it's a double vinyl um and it's going to be kind of limited as well so stay tuned to the uh mwo podcast uh this coming week hmm, might okay. be something about that okay because i don't i don't want to say maybe they've not announced it yet i don't know but, oh uh, come on can't you give us a scoop <laughs> Come on, you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, how do you like it, motherfucker? How do you like that, huh? Huh? Yeah. 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 I, can't, uh, I, 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 I don't want to ruin their scoop. They like announcing stuff. So. Oh, oh, oh. So you don't want to ruin their <laughs> scoop, but it's okay for me to ruin scoops for everybody else, huh? For us? Oh. You've known us long <clears throat> any of these people. We should so? have preference. <laughs> so what? So, so what? So, <laughs> I'm going to go back and watch every single thing we've done with Felcher and try to figure out what his tales are when he's lying about this shit. <laughs> I'm, sure, then, I, I'm like, sure I have tales, I'm sure. Yeah. But I don't think it's as obvious. That, no, no, we're not doing that. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. no. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or, or it's like, oh, shit, they asked about that. Uh, No. <laughs> no. 
Earth uh, Girls are, easy, are easy as like the. Go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say I'm I'm super psyched that you guys have come around to Bruiser a little bit. At least you're yeah, that's not com- great. Not compelled to trash it. Like I mean, you know, it, it stings a little bit when you just crush it. It's just like, come on, it's better. Than I mean, that, I think I, I look. I can understand <laughs> someone not liking that movie. I can totally yeah. understand it. It's not. It's not a. In, it's not a mass audience movie. You know, he no. made a film that was very specific in its ideas and its tone, and not everyone's going to respond to it. I didn't at first either, um, but I don't think you can deny that there, like I said, there's meat on the bone there. That there's something worth discussing. That it's not worthless or a throwaway or some well, mindless I, piece of crap. You know? I truly believe that it, it's a it's a movie that's made that I don't think like maybe younger audiences would would get as much as like older audiences because there's so much stuff going on with it you know mm-hmm. you gotta live a little before it makes yeah sense. You. you do yeah. you kind of do yeah if you watch it when you're a teenager you'd be like geez what's this guy's problem you know <laughs> he's rich he's got yeah, a hot rich. wife what the fuck's yeah, this problem what the hell you i like your house looks good <laughs> just finish it off asshole you know i mean really this, <laughs> you can take now, a long prick but but now i watch that guy and say yeah i get it i'd like to kill that <laughs> motherfucker too you know it's like yeah you know? and so yeah it's it definitely it's one that uh Again, George made that at a very specific point in his life, and I can, when I watched that, I was just like, yeah, yeah. There's a lot he's getting. He's working through some stuff with this with this story, definitely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Processing something. Sorry. What was the we, um, West Ray says? Not. <laughs> Go ahead. Wait, what wait, I got to put this up real quick. West Ray says a tale. Literally, every time you ask him about trick or treat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Love you, Wes. <laughs> mean it. Am I lying? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know I what? He legally can't say anything. So I, I can't I don't, say anything I'm about anything anymore. So. No. Yeah. I can talk about tricks. Silent Night, Deadly Night now. But Silent Night, Deadly Night. That's what I was going to... That was yeah. just recently announced. People yes. are buying the shit out of that. It's a very fair price as well. Yeah, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I waited yeah. too long. It's twenty three bucks now. It's still worth it. For oh, I ordered. Yeah, I ordered it. Yeah, <laughs> I was that. I had a lot of fun working on that project, man. Everyone really came out on that. I, I, I was worried. It's like, are they going to want? Everyone wanted to talk about working on those movies. Everyone had a great time making those movies. And they're fun. They're interesting films. You got to say that when you watch these three movies, it's just like, well, this series spun off in some directions. I sure as hell didn't think it was going to go off into. And uh, yeah, it, it, I'm re- this. I'm really, really proud of this set coming up. But that's I could talk about that some other time. But that yeah. Okay, it's, so it, it's on the website though. The the Night Riders is coming from Scare Flare Records. Bulls, a new Scare kind Flare. of a new label. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Problem. That's awesome eventually at some point in time it's coming so i don't know but Pretty um limited though from what i understand get on it don't don't yeah that sound i really do like that soundtrack quite a bit it's too. great oh it's yeah. beautiful. it's beautiful i mean it's just i can't uh, imagine a more perfect soundtrack for that film yeah it's, rubenstein was uh, clued in and he understood the vibe of that movie so mm-hmm. well yeah i mean that's just, and the songs that he can try i mean just come on the dueling themes and oh yeah it's just, yeah it's all there well, we've got to bring up uh, the 4K of King's Flag. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Wes, I swear to God. Wes, I swear to God, I got one nerve left and you're all over it, pal. <laughs> Is the best version of that that sorry Code Red DVD? I think so. I think Ugh, that's I, I don't... putrid. Yeah. Like I just can't believe VHS. I can't fucking believe we have the type of audience where you break that kind of news about like having all that audio from Romero and then, and then 4K some... King Fran. <laughs> exactly. <It's like laughs> 4K. If fuck here in the Romero stuff, I want me some King Fran. <laughs> there's a there's a farting contest in it. Yeah, it's like, come on, man. There's some no, a, I don't a, know anything a about a fried brick of shit that they burn in it. <laughs> I don't know anything Kill about a. I don't know. No, I don't. We cannot talk about fucking. King Frat yet. Oh, God. Oh, God. Uh, but guys, I <laughs> what a perfect way to I, end. Yeah, I mean, we'll end it on King Frat. Hopefully, you know, <laughs> well, somehow this ended up on King Frat. Find out what's going on with King Frat. We can get a full <laughs> that out. <coughs> oh, man. I would not Can't have wait. thought the Romero discussion would end on, hey, what uh, about King Frat? King Frat. No, we'll, I'll buy it. It, it. It's just ending for now. Hopefully, you know. 
we'll do another one of these at some point. You guys can come back and we'll pick a couple more. Anytime. I, would, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of, you ask me to come in and talk about George. That's really not hard for me to yeah. sign up for something like that. Doesn't matter what the movie is. Yeah, really. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's just like, you know, he's, everything he did was worth discussing. So. Agreed. Cool. So is there anything else before we get all, uh, out of here that you guys have coming up that you want to mention? Uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, the uh, Garf Network. Uh, we, we've been a little slow lately, but uh, we, you know, routinely put out shows, uh, interviews and such. If you get a chance, check out the Garf Network on Facebook.com or Garf Network on Facebook. And uh, yeah, and, and check out uh, George A. Romero Foundation.org and donate by the end of the month if you get a chance or buy some merch. Much appreciated. And um, I'm actually going to be doing an 8K of King Frat. <laughs> God, it'll be awesome. 8K. Can see all that Canadian frat house. You glory. guys are doing something on the the midnight hour, or is that? Oh yeah, on our on uh, the Spooky Picture Show, we we did a cast reunion for the movie The Midnight Hour, uh, which is a great, great you know little monster mash from the uh, TV movie from the mid 80s. <laughs> Uh, hmm. That hasn't really gotten a lot of love, but I mean, everyone kind of knows about it and has seen it at one point or another. And we got three members of the cast, uh, three ladies from the film, and we had a great time. It's a it's a really crazy chat, and uh, hope people enjoy that when it comes out. And uh, we also have uh, our we just aired our Halloween episode where we talk about all the Halloween movies, including Halloween Ends and all the batshit crazy stuff that happens in that movie. Uh, so it's, uh, Love that's it. up right now. 10 out so of 10. Go to Sp- go look up the spooky picture show on, uh, Spotify or favorite podcasting platform and, uh, enjoy the shit out of it. Cause we, we have some, we have some good times on that for sure. So here's cool. what I want to know though, before we end this, which one's better dawn of the dead or Halloween ends. I haven't seen ends yet. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to make my final judgment later. Even if I hadn't seen Halloween ends, <laughs> I could have given you the answer to that question. <laughs> I have Dawn of the Dead's the greatest movie made bar yeah, none. I, I, mean, a, I mean, you're asking, it was like one of the greatest fucking movies I've ever seen in my life or potentially Halloween ends. I literally uh, challenge people at work. I'm like, if you don't like Dawn of the Dead, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I, Joe's not a fan of Dawn of the Dead. That's to hell with yeah. him. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, what are you going to do? Some people are weird. But I, I, I no, I, I would say Dawn of the Dead is a little bit better than Halloween ends. Yes. I think so. Probably. Yeah. And Even I've seen Dawn Halloween of the Dead ends, remake speak... is better than Halloween ends. It is. Oh, actually <laughs> I would did. agree with it. I like the Dawn uh, If we're going to start sitting here to decide what movies are better than Halloween ends, we're going to go through a long list. <laughs> King Frat. King Frat. Day- <laughs> Creep show three. Mm, no. It, no, we're talking no. movies. I yeah. don't know what, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I think that might be the only movie that is not, as good as Halloween. Again, that's not a movie, so I don't really know how to <sighs> qualify that question. But, but guys, we appreciate you again. We'll have to do this again sometime. It's good to yeah. finally get. I had uh, Eric on an MWO show a few months ago, but get you on a live stream. It's you know long history there, and it's always good talking to Sleepy and getting updates on Trick or Treat and the Elm Street set. Uh, it's coming soon, right? Uh, Guys, I'm available for you anytime you want because I wouldn't even be doing what I'm doing without you guys doing what you did first. And and I want to say this real quick too. Like you guys, you started a podcast around 2005. I started one around two, 2010 that's not going on anymore. But people listened to that and got inspired and they did their own thing. They created their own podcast and that, that ball is still rolling. And every time, whether they listen to you or not, I always... I always put you guys over. I'm like, I wouldn't be doing any any of this without what you guys were doing. You guys set the bar, and uh, I want to thank you guys for that because you've provided me with endless years of entertainment. And you know, until recently, I haven't paid a cent for it. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I mean, you guys, you, you created a lot of memories for me. I. I I, I love what you guys do and I've, I've listened to every, every, everything you've ever done. And, um, I would, I, I mean that I wouldn't be doing this unless you had given me the idea to do it. 
So I, I really appreciate what you guys have done for the last 17 years or so. Damn, it's been too long. <laughs> God That's damn nuts, it. man. Speaking for myself, I never much liked either one of you. I knew that was coming, too. I was fucking <laughs> waiting on it. It's like a countdown. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I can, I said, Eric, I mean, what were you like three or four years old when they first came online? <laughs> You're just a little kid, you know? So, I, I, mean, I remember just... when, uh, that you did the, the Christmas, the Chuck Sellier Christmas interview. Oh, yeah. And I, <laughs> yeah. and I remember I was coming home Christmas night listening to that. And I had my infant son in the car and he's, 16 years old now. So Jesus just, Christ. Yeah. This is just fucked up to hear this guy. Like, that's how that, old you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the... Uh, oh. I, have, I came across a picture of us oh. at some convention. I don't know when the hell it was. But I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, look how young we all fucking look. I this. know. Like, this wasn't that long ago. And then I went, I was going, oh 16, God. Years. There's, There's one awesome. picture. There's one picture of like... Um, of all of us standing at like it was some like we went to a movie. video store yeah video so, store yeah, yeah and like we're all like the whole crew there's probably ten people there or something like that or yeah. something and yeah we all look like we're about twelve years old so <laughs> no it's, it's like it's like what like, when did this when did when, when did I become this old man <laughs> this bullshit, what I would like I don't to know like those when did podcasts even become a word because I don't, I'm pretty sure I didn't know what the hell that was. When we started, I, I, certainly it was, it not back horror. when you started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was it was horror talk radio. I mean, that's what that's it was. Right. What you called? It. I mean, it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. And then back then, it was just fun to see you guys get screwed over at the Rondos every year. Because <laughs> it would always be kind of derisive. It was like, Dead Pit, Rednecks talking horror or some That's shit. Right. It was yeah. just like, yeah, fucking That's pretty much what it was. Yeah. 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 So, so it was just kind of like, and then it was Rue Morgue Radio one like every year. And so it was always fun to call and say, hey, Rue Morgue one again. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> next year, next year's your year, I swear to God. <laughs> I know well, there was some reason year when when we were there. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, feedback left like a video message or something. Oh, yeah, <laughs> making yeah, fun did. of us. Yeah, yeah. Did. yeah, while we were sitting there in the crowd, <laughs> that, that was, was so great. good. I knew he was going to do that too, and I'm just I'm sitting there the whole time like <laughs> I just can't wait for this. I gotta uh, say though, I don't think that was our audience in hindsight. Like, no, I don't think probably, the Rondo Awards. Probably like, not. Probably. I don't not. think it was our crowd. Yeah. No, but uh, uh, anyway, but if yeah, we you got the, you know, the yeah. old horror radio cobweb fart hour. Then we probably would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please do a show called that. <laughs> Oh, that was the God. that was the guys that talked to what Universal Horror? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no fart. But no. guys, hey, it's it's been fun. <laughs> I knew this show would be fun, and hopefully, you know, we can do one of yeah, these it was again great. real soon. Anytime, uh, anytime. Of yeah. course, it's not even. Uh, just let me know. Yeah, cool. Just, yeah, just 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 send up the bat signal, and we'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Just Don't leave know, me the, out of uh, vanilla. The, 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 yeah, do the the logo, the Romero logo. Family was like. We we are needed. And we, shall go, <laughs> we shall go to Streamyard and await our, our time on the show. But yeah, we appreciate everybody tuning in and everything, and everybody watching the archive. And uh, we will catch you guys next time over at deadpit.com. Give us the thumbs up. Off you butt. Like, subscribe. And if you subscribe, here's something else you can do. Once you subscribe, you can click the bell notification, right? And it'll notify you anytime that Dead Pit puts up new shit. Or don't. I really don't give a f- if you do. I want you to. I want you to. <laughs> I don't let's, care. let's keep our community growing here on I, YouTube. I don't, I don't like it. I don't want you to do nothing. Listen, they need to do that, pal. No, don't you yeah. dare touch it. Thumbs up subscribe and click that bell before this video officially ends oh curly jaws has a message for you go on over to shop.deadpit.com and go look at their team public store right now you've got some new shirts like the oh curly jaws official t-shirt which is brutal and badass you got the yummy gummy shirt the captain himself on the shirt. The people you got Uncle Bill's face on a fucking shirt. You got the final girl shirt. You got all these shirts over at chop.deadpit.com. Get them before they're all out, especially the new one, 
been comped in 39. It doesn't get better than that. So go on out. Check out these shirts at shop.deadpit.com. Go look at their team public store. You're going to have a good old time. Get them all. Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Dead Pit on Patreon.com is the only place to check out a complete archive of the old Dead Pit radio shows all the way back from 2005 on, in addition to the midweek shows and fan commentaries, exclusive podcasts, and much more. Dead Pit on Patreon.com if you're interested. Tears start at only $1. <laughs> 